Yes, Can I just sir? ask you a quick question? Sorry, before we start. Sure. Um, the epidural hematoma is what? Remind me, please. So, so when you have different types of bleeding inside the skull, they classify it by the location. So the, the dura matter is the is the, the the wrapping around the brain. So there's a bunch of different layers around the brain. So you have your hair, then you have your skin, then you have your skull, which is the bone, and then underneath your bone, there's different wrappings around the brain. So one of them is called the dura matter, right? It means like tough, tough dura means like durable, right? And if the bleeding is above the dura and below the skull, right? So in other words, it's above that, that wrapping, but below the bone, that's called an epidural hematoma. And that's usually arterial and quickly, usually pretty quickly develops. And then if the bleeding is under the dura matter and basically pressing down on the brain, that's called a subdural. And that's usually venous. So it's a, a venous in nature, veins bleeding. So that's a little slower to develop. So that's the two types of uh, bleeding. So it's really just, it's, in other words, it's all inside your skull, but it's just depending on where it is in relationship to those linings. And the bigger thing to, to realize is that the, the epidural tends to be the quicker one because it's arterial. And epidural is usually developed from blows to the side of the head, not to the front of the head, to the side of the head. Um, and there's an artery that runs along the side of your skull called your, uh, uh, what's it called? Your middle meningeal artery. And when people are struck in the side of the head, it's very easy to lacerate it and bleed. So obviously you would have to be bleeding internally. Um, so that's why when people tell us, you know, or we see that they hit the side of their head, you know, we're always concerned when somebody strikes their head, but a blow to the side of the head is usually more indicative of a, uh, you know, an epidural hematoma, which very quickly develops. And there's a very classic um, presentation, which is that they're typically knocked out unconscious from the blow to the head, right? So however, they hit their head or something banged them in the head. So they're knocked unconscious from that. Then they wake up. So whether they wake up in you know one minute or three minutes, whatever, they wake up, okay? So the first unconsciousness is the, just because of the blow to the head, you know, the striking of the head. Um, then they wake up. That's called a lucid interval, L-U-C-I-D. They have what's called a lucid interval, which means they wake up. When you're lucid, it means you can communicate, you can talk. So they wake up, but then they become unconscious again. And when they become unconscious, the second time they stay unconscious. The second unconsciousness is because of the bleeding, putting pressure on the brain. So how quickly they become unconscious kind of gives you an idea of how much bleeding is going on. So the quicker they become unconscious the second time means the more severe the bleeding is. And then we said that anytime somebody has pressure inside their skull from bleeding, right? The, the, it raises what's called the inter, intracerebral, uh, intracerebral ble uh, pressure in your, inside your head. And it puts pressure on the brain and tries to force the brain down, you know, through the little hole at the bottom of your skull called the frame and magnum. And that, that process is called brain herniation. And that when that happens, typically the vital signs become the opposite of shock, which means the patient becomes hypertensive and they become bradycardic. And that's all in relationship that the part of the brain that sits right above that, that opening, the frame and magnum, the opening where the spinal uh, cord comes up into the brain, the connection, like it's the, the hole in the base of your skull that allows the nerve to come up into the brain. Um, that part of that brain is called your brainstem or your medulla oblongata and the, your what they call vegetative functions. Your basic functions are controlled by that section of the brain. So blood pressure, diameter, um, heart rate, um, breathing. Uh, pupils, all that kind of stuff. So, so what you start seeing is you see the blood pressure go up, the pulse go down, the breathing become very irregular. Okay, uh, the pupil on the side of the injury typically becomes what they call fixed and dilated, which means it gets very big, and it doesn't um, re react to light. So the fixed means it doesn't react to light. It's typically when you shine a light on a pupil, it should constrict, and it becomes blown or dilated, very very big. Okay. And then when they get real big, we said the other night, they have the abnormal posturing where their arms will come up this way. That's called the corticate. And then their arms will basically come out the other way. And that's called the cerebrate posturing. That's a very, you know, bad sign. That's a severe, um, you know, severe presentation of it. Um, so really all we can do is get the patient to the hospital as quick as possible, trying as best we can to maintain an airway, but we don't want to force anything in their mouth because if you make them gag, like let's, let's say you try to force an oral airway in their mouth and you make them gag, 
just think when you were throwing up, sometimes you feel that pressure in your head. So when you make somebody gag, you actually increase the pressure in their skull. So since the problem is caused by too much pressure in the skull, you never want to force anything to make them gag. So really what it would basically be is just as best as you can maintain an airway if they're, you know, put them on some oxygen, if they're not breathing to ventilate them, but not to make them gag and maybe transport them with the head of the stretcher slightly elevated. So there's less pressure. In other words, leaving them flat would result in more pressure to their head. So maybe elevate them, you know, whatever, 30 degrees up on the stretcher a little bit to relieve the pressure. But this is, you know, a, a high priority patient definitely should go to a trauma center if you think you could make it to it, um, you know, versus a community hospital setting, because they're going to need what's called neurosurgery. They're going to have to have somebody drill a hole through the bone and put in a device to relieve the pressure that's developing inside their, uh, in their skull. So somebody asked, how do you know if it's epi or sub? So you don't know, but on a test, if they say to you, it very quickly developed, it's usually going to be epidural because epidural hematomas are arterial and obviously arterial bleed quicker than venous. Um, if they say to you, it took days to weeks to develop, then that's usually subdural because that's venous. Epidural typically happens around the time of the injury, the signs and symptoms, and subdural typically um, can happen, you know, hours, days, you know, weeks later, even months later, because it's venous. So um, I don't know, did I, did I explain it okay? Is there anything else? Yeah, yeah no, that's fine. It just so it's very close to contusion because the subdural, it's, I mean, it's not in a contusion, but it's very close to it. So to be honest with you, a contusion, a hematoma, uh, an ecchymosis, they all kind of mean the same thing. Right. Okay. It's a, basically a collection of blood. Um, they usually use a contusion. Um, well, like it's kind of hard. Like I was going to say, they usually use a contusion when it's visible, but we do have a thing called a pulmonary contusion, which is when, when somebody has blunt trauma to their chest so in other words, they're struck in their chest, it goes through their ribs, okay, and hits their lung, the pressure, the force. And, you know, the lungs may break, they may not break, but the, the lung itself gets contused, gets filled with blood, so there's not good oxygenation. So they really use all those terms interchangeably. I'm sure there's some more precise definition for each one, but they kind of use those all, you know, interchangeably. So this one happens to be called the hematoma, maybe because it, you know, maybe it's more active bleeding. And I, you know, I don't know, I'd have to look it up and see if there's a real technical difference between, you know, contusion and hematoma. I know with ecchymosis, we saw that on one of the state exams and ecchymosis, they're usually going to say that it's black and blue in color and purplish. So an ecchymosis is always an old, an old bruise, right? These are all really just what we would call a bruise in, in non-medical terms, but uh, an ecchymosis, E-C-C-H-Y-M-O-S-I-S, -S, I guess, um, that's, that's typically when it turns purplish and black and blue, and that's usually old, right? That's at least a day or two old for it to turn black and blue because that's the old blood that's trapped inside the tissue of the skin kind of breaking down and getting reabsorbed. So, you know, it's, there's no precise way of, you know, describing the difference, but I'll try to look it up a little bit and see if there's, you know, any better way of explaining it. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions before we start the anaphylaxis? Looks like in the brain, the arteries are above the veins versus in the body, I would say that the veins are closer to the outside to the surface than the, the arteries, no? Um, well, yes and no. Usually the bigger the blood vessel, so the bigger veins are deeper in, the bigger arteries are deeper in, and the more the smaller ones are more superficial or closer to the surface. Um, you know, but the, the blood vessel that's always closest to the surface is going to be a capillary. You know, that's pretty much the one that's always going to be closest, but you don't see those, right? You can't see that with a naked, a naked eye. So, um, you know, I don't know in what context you're, you're, you're saying that, you know, I mean, as far as a head injury goes, you know, everything in the skull is kind of so close to each other because it's just not a lot of room. So, um, you know, arteries and veins are probably running right alongside each other in those cases. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So tonight, well, first of all, actually, um, I got some feedback on, um, I guess, your last skills session, or maybe, I don't know if it was an extra session, where um, there were some instructors doing question and answer stuff, um, specifically going over shock and some other things. So I got some feedback from a couple people, and it seemed like it went very, very well. So if you think that that would help, and you guys have the time, I could try to set up and see if I can get some instructors just to come, and, you know, you could do face-to-face you know, question and answer versus doing it the way we're doing it over Zoom and stuff like that. 
Um, so, you know, whatever, just text me, let me know if you think that's helpful. And I could see if I can get some guys together. It doesn't even have to be on a Sunday. It could be in the evening, you know, uh, after eight o'clock or something like that. You guys can just meet um, and do it that way. And if you want, I could even try to set one up in, you know, KJ. So everybody who lives up there doesn't have to drive all the way down. And uh, then I'll set one up in, uh, in Rockland. Okay. Sounds good to me. Okay. So just text me if you think it's good. And we'll, I'll work on seeing when I can get some people available to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to do it. Okay. Okay, so you know we're in the home stretch. Um, we still have a bunch, you know, a bunch of classes to do, but we're definitely in the home stretch. So if you haven't cracked the uh, the binding on the book yet, definitely start opening it and doing some reading. Um, and uh, you know, it's not going to hurt you to do some review and stuff like that. Do we want to have a? Um, do we want to have a, a review class Matzah Shabbos again? Well, I'll send it out. I'll be on. I'll be on. And if anybody else wants to join, you're more than welcome um, to be able to join, um, you know, and uh, if you can't do it, you can't do it, I understand, but I'll, I'll set one up and whoever wants to uh, participate can participate. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, both my boys are away this Shabbos, so I don't really have anything going on. Okay. So it's what we're really talking about, something called anaphylaxis. Um, so anaphylaxis is the most severe manifestation of an allergic reaction, right? We've all had allergic reactions, you know, uh, our nose was running, our skin got itchy, um, you know, whatever, whatever it would be, um, you know, but when it's anaphylaxis, it's life-threatening, right? So that's what we're really uh, going to talk about tonight because we don't really treat allergic reactions, um, you know, in the pre-hospital setting, we treat more or less anaphylaxis. It's not to say we may get somebody who calls with a mild allergic reaction and we, we're just gonna drive them to the hospital, but we don't treat them with epinephrine and stuff like that if they're just having a mild allergic reaction. We really you know, uh, treat what's called anaphylaxis. So we'll, and they, on the test, they kind of use it interchangeably, like a lot of words, unfortunately. You know, we said the other night, you know, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, they kind of use contusion, hematoma, they use them all interchangeably and it, it, it makes it a little confusing. But anyway, when we're talking about allergic reactions. We're talking about when your immune system, and we've said a few times already that our immune system is the part of our body that's designed to protect us from things that do not belong in our body, right? So whatever doesn't belong in your body, your immune system is designed to fight it off. So our immune system has substances called antibodies that are designed to attack cells, viruses, bacteria, anything that doesn't belong in your body, okay, to rid your body of it before they could do any damage, okay? Now, a lot of times, the way your immune system works is that the, the substance, you have to be exposed to it once to actually produce those antibodies. But it doesn't mean that you're not without protection because there are certain substances, we know already white blood cells, you know, but there's different cells in our body that don't care whether they've ever seen the thing before or not, they will always respond when they perceive something to be, you know, not belonging in your body. Okay. So they attack it and they try to get rid of it. Now, when we talk about anaphylaxis, we're saying that that response, that normal response that we probably have all the time, like, you know, we have a little, uh, you know, a little cut somewhere and it gets red for a day or two or three, and then it goes away. Well, that, that's actually your immune system saving you. So, you know, what happened was it was starting to get effect, infected and your immune system sent cells to the site of the, the infection and actually uh, fought it, okay? So the redness we're gonna see is one of the signs and symptoms we see when there is uh, an allergic reaction going on and that's caused by the vasodilation to the area, okay? Sometimes you'll, you know, see that you get itchy. That's also because of a different substance called histamine. So, you know, your immune system probably every minute of every year day is kind of looking at things and trying to fight them. One of the big things in cancer treatment now, not all cancers, but certain cancers, is they actually, cancer cells have the ability to hide from your immune system. So your immune system has no way of attacking them. So one of the things they've been able to do is to basically get rid of that hiding of the cancer cells. And they actually have a lot of different cancers now where they can successfully have the body's immune system attack it and get rid of it without having to do chemo and radiation and everything like that. So, you know, your immune system is very, very powerful. Okay. And, uh, you know, see here in anaphylaxis that what happens in certain people is that for some reason, their immune system goes crazy and goes out of control. And we know that's the same thing, you know, with COVID, right? Some people have COVID, they have a headache, they have a runny nose, they're sick for a couple of days, they're fine. Other people have COVID and, you know, everybody thought it was a pneumonia that they've developed, they, this they developed, but they found it basically 
what it is with COVID, it's an over response of the immune system trying to protect you. It's just going too crazy. So it's kind of like a anaphylactic reaction of the immune system, but not interfering with breathing and stuff like that, that we were, we're gonna talk about tonight, right? So one of the ways they're treating COVID now is actually to give medications to kind of suppress the immune system, which doesn't really make sense if you think about it, because the immune system is supposed to be what's fighting the COVID. But what they're doing is they're, they're just kind of relaxing the immune system to the point where it's still fighting, but it's not killing the person in the process of trying to fight it. So, you know, that's, it's kind of what the immune system is supposed to do. So when we say an allergic reaction, it's basically that somebody's having, and here they say an exaggerated response, but they're having a response to something that doesn't belong in their body, right? Okay. The allergen is the thing that they're, you know, having that response to, and they're not going to ask you allergen and, and all these different terms that we're going to use. They may ask antibodies, but they're not going to ask a lot of these different terms that we're going to see in a second, but just to, you know, kind of understand it tonight. Okay. So what happens with the immune system? So the first, ex first exposure, okay, of something that doesn't belong in your body, okay, the immune systems recognize it, okay, that it doesn't belong there, okay, and it starts to produce specific antibodies, okay, to fight it, but it also has just like the heavy hitters that are always there that can attack anything without. So the difference between their specific antibodies, like you hear about this uh, convalescent plasma, you know, that people are getting with COVID where they basically took the plasma, the fluid portion of the blood from people who had had COVID survived and have high antibody levels in it. So this is what we're talking about that in that case, they're harvesting the antibodies from a patient who survived COVID to give it to a patient who just got COVID and has not yet produced the antibodies to it, right? So that's what they're kind of trying to do. It's, it, you know, the jury is out on whether it's very helpful or not, but uh, that's what they're, you know, trying to do with it, okay? So what the antibodies will do basically is attack the foreign substance, the cell of the foreign substance, and try to kill it, to try to stop it from reproducing so there'll be less of it. And, you know, like I said, it's happening every day inside of our body. When we talk about anaphylaxis, it's just that it's going too crazy. And in the process of doing it, it's, it's closing off your airway, it's vasodilating your blood vessels and so on and so on, okay? So the first time around, you don't really have the antibodies, but you have other substances in your body that can fight it. The second time around, okay, that you get it, the antibodies already exist, okay? And the antibodies will attack it much quicker, but problem is that they cause a secretion of a, of a substance in your body called histamine, okay? And histamine sometimes is the one that causes our problems with anaphylaxis, okay? And you've ter heard the term antihistamines, which are medications you take to like when you have a runny nose or you have itchy eyes, all the like, you know, the seasonal allergies. So antihistamines are basically fighting the effects of histamine, okay? So, you know, but when somebody's having anaphylaxis, it's a little late for hist ant antihistamines, so we actually go to more stronger drugs like epinephrine and stuff like that. Okay. Did you ever, um, I don't know, you, you, you feel like you're getting sick, okay? And then you do get sick. So for two, three days, you kind of feel, you know, every day you're getting a little sicker, sicker. But then at some point, whether it's three days, four days into it, you start not feeling any sicker, maybe not exactly feeling better yet, but you're definitely not feeling any sicker. Then the next day you start feeling like you're getting a little better and every progressive day you start feeling a little better. That's actually your immune system. So what ha happened is that, you know, the, the whatever, the, the virus entered your body, the bacteria entered your body. It took a day or two to kind of take hold. That's when you started noticing it, okay? And then it took a little time for your immune system to start recognizing and attacking it, okay? Now, if it's the first time you're exposed to it, it's gonna take you a couple days, right? Because you don't have specific antibodies yet developed to fight it. So it's gonna take you a few days, okay? One, to start producing those antibodies and two, for the other substances in your body to kind of win the battles. So that's why typically when you, you know, when you have a viral infection, it takes a few days um, before your immune system kind of wins the battle, um, so to speak, and, uh, and turns the corner. Now, in people who are older, run down, what they call immune suppressed, whether they're taking medications that suppress their immune system or they have conditions that are suppressing their immune system, they don't have that very vigorous response of their immune system, so they may not actually survive the infection. Okay. And then we see the other way, you know, like we were just talking what happened with COVID is that there are some people whose immune systems are very healthy, but, and because they're so healthy, they over-respond and because they over-respond with such severity, they, um, 
you know, they, uh, they cause a second problem, which kills the patient. Okay, so now what happens when we have this histamine release into the bloodstream? So histamine causes basically swelling, like vasodilation type of swelling to occur. Okay, in the airway, it causes bronchoconstriction to occur. So what kills somebody in anaphylaxis, right? So the first thing we always worry about is breathing problems. So anaphylaxis causes swelling along the whole length of your airway, okay? So you have laryngeal constriction, which gives you strider, right? So larynx is the upper part of your trachea. You have bronchoconstriction, okay, which is the lower part of your airway. Uh, bronchoconstriction gives you wheezing, right? So we said strider is an inspiratory sound when somebody's breathing in and wheezing is an expiratory sound when somebody's exhaling typically. Um, you have the vasodilation, okay, of the blood vessels, which drops the blood pressure. Also with the, um, with all this vasodilation, you get a lot of swelling on the, uh, from the blood vessels, okay? So you'll see people have anaphylaxis, their eyes, lids swell up, their ears, their tongue, their lips. And if that's happening externally, you know, that we can see it with our eyes, it's also happening internally. So, you know, that's also contributing to the trouble breathing and stuff like that. And then the last thing that kind of happens is that the capillaries get more permeable. So permeability means the ability for things to come in and out of the capillaries. And we know the capillaries are the only blood vessels that have the ability to let things in, in and out of them because they, that's their job, right? They have to let oxygen and sugar and all different things in and out of them. But when they become more permeable, what happens is plasma starts to leak out of them. And when plasma leaks out of them, it causes swelling, right? So we see it as hives. We see it as the lips getting swollen, the eyes getting swollen and stuff like that. And that's also happening internally in the airways. And that's all contributing to the fact that the patient cannot breathe. Okay, so anaphylaxis is the worst manifestation of an allergic reaction. Life-threatening, people can die within minutes from it, okay? And the thing that typically kills them right off the bat is airway. So the first thing you're always going to see is airway problems. Okay. So again, the larynx can, can swell or the bronchioles can swell. So laryngeal swelling, okay, or laryngeal edema is an upper airway problem, causes a sound strider. Bronchoconstriction, like bronchioles constriction, is the lower airways going down to the alveoli. Okay. And both of those can very quickly uh, cause someone not to be able to breathe. Then the next step of anaphylaxis is that the blood vessels dilate. Okay, and the pressure drops. Now, the problem with that is that the drugs we're going to give them are not going to work well, okay, if their blood pressure drops because they're not going to be absorbed and transported to the body. So it's much better to treat them when they're in the um, airway stage, okay, or actually even before they get bad than it is to, you know, wait to see what's happening and then the blood, the blood pressure drops and the medication is not going to be absorbed. So the questions people always have is when do I treat them? You know, I get there. They tell me they ate something they shouldn't have eaten or they were stung by a bee. They don't look so bad. You know, when should I treat them? That's always the, the classic question. So what I would say to you is the first thing I always ask a patient is, is, has this ever happened to you before? So they say, yes. Okay. So then I say to them, okay, so how bad does it get? If they say to you, I almost die, my throat closes, you know, uh, and stuff like that, you don't really have to wait for them to get much worse or you're just going to treat them. Right. And, you know, you're not going to wait for them to have more serious symptoms or anything like that. If they say to you, oh, well, this time it's not definitely not as bad as usual. I feel OK. You know, it's not too bad, but I didn't want to take a chance on waiting. Then you may say, OK, let's give it a minute and see what happens. Now, if somebody says to you, no, this never happened to me before. OK, then the decision is all on you. Right. Because you have nothing to gauge it against. So this never this never really happened before. Um, you know, I don't know what's happening. I just have this feeling you know, like uh, my throat's closing, right? So as soon as a patient tells me anything about that they're having trouble breathing, whether it's my throat feels like it's tightening, my chest feels heavy, I'm itchy, my throat feels like it's itchy or burning or anything like that, I treat them, okay? Now, the reason some people might be saying, well, why don't we just treat everybody right away? Just you have to remember that epinephrine, the drug epinephrine, what does it do to the heart? It basically puts the biggest load. It's like having the, a, a two-hour stress test on your heart. Because remember, if they're having breathing problems, their oxygen is low. Epinephrine makes the heart work harder than it's ever probably worked before. And what does the heart need to be able to do that? Oxygen. So it's not getting the oxygen because of the anaphylaxis. So you have what's called you know, a mismatch from the amount of oxygen the heart needs to the amount of oxygen the heart is getting. And you could trigger somebody to have problems, right? Heart attacks and stuff like that. But the alternative, right, is that they could have anaphylaxis and die. So the rule basically is that there is no zero contraindications to treating somebody in anaphylaxis. So somebody's truly in anaphylaxis, 
and you feel they need to be treated, there's no reason in the world you wouldn't treat them. Even if they told you, I just got out of the hospital, I had a heart attack, I just got out of the hospital, I had two stents put in, they told me I have to go back and have bypass surgery, you know, and then the bee flew in the car and stung them, and now their lips are swelling, they can't breathe, they're turning blue. You would have to treat them, okay, and give them epinephrine, fully knowing that treating them for anaphylaxis may cause a problem with their heart because their heart is so fragile. So that's a very tough situation. You know, now, again, if you're two seconds from the hospital, I might just throw them in the ambulance and drive around the corner real quick and let the hospital decide what to do. But guaranteed, you're not going to be, you know, two seconds from a hospital when this happens. So there is no contraindication to treating somebody who's in anaphylaxis. Okay. It's just that if they're having mild symptoms, they're a little itchy, right? Their skin's a little red. Maybe they have some hives, but they're not having any complaints of any kind of breathing, no problems, no itchiness, no tightness, no shortness of breath, no whatever, no complaints of it whatsoever. Then we may just say, okay, let's put them in the ammo and start going. And if at any point it changes where they have any complaints of, you know, any kind of breathing problems, then we would go ahead and treat them. Okay. Frank. Yes. So if somebody tells me the bee bit them or something, it feels that it closes, it's like it's getting hard in them. Is, is the right answer by that epinephrine? So, that some, be... so wait, so let's go back. So somebody got stung by a bee, okay? And it feels like uh, his body gets hot because the first time it happened. Right. And it feels like it's, uh, like his airway is closing, like he has pressure. Okay, so if he has any complaint about having any trouble breathing, I would go ahead and treat him. Absolutely. Okay. Epinephrine right away. Yep. It's the only thing you have as an EMT, right? I mean, in other words, you have you don't have antihistamines, you don't have steroids. You have epinephrine and you have albuterol. Albuterol is not going to reverse anaphylaxis because to reverse anaphylaxis, you have to have a drug that does two things: that opens up the airways okay, and constricts the blood vessels. So the only drug that you have that opens up airways and constricts blood vessels at the same time is epinephrine. Albuterol does relax the airways, but it only relaxes the lower airways, the bronchioles. So it's not going to do anything for the larynx. Uh -huh. so if you had to treat somebody who's moving into anaphylaxis, it's going to be epinephrine, no doubt about it. Okay. And this is a tough decision. I mean, and you know, the other, the other thing that we'll talk about in a second is that, you know, a lot of ambulances now are carrying epinephrine not as an auto injector, but where you have to draw it up. Okay, so you're not gonna feel so comfortable, right? You're gonna learn it in class, you're gonna practice it once or twice in class, and you're probably never gonna see it again, unless the ambulance corps you belong to actually does practice with it you know, on a regular basis. And I'll tell you right now that with COVID, there's none of that going on. So there's probably, at least now you're going probably over a year, year and a half from when we last practice it, say where, you know, where I would have the, any of the ambulances that I teach for, okay? So, you know, now somebody's dying of anaphylaxis and they have to, and you're going to see, because you're going to do it this weekend, um, you have to figure out how to draw up the right amount of medication injected in someone. If you don't have an auto injector and an auto injector, it's already there. You just have to remember how to do it, which is uncap it and press it on them. So it's very simple. So if that was the case and you have somebody who's starting to say, well, you know, maybe I'm not sure I would actually, if you're using the, draw, the epinephrine where you draw it up, I would actually draw it up. I would start the process of drawing it up. And if you don't use it, yeah, you wasted 20 bucks. You know, um, I wouldn't uncap an EpiPen until the last second because an EpiPen is a couple hundred dollars and it takes two seconds to get an EpiPen ready. But if you were drawing it up, okay, I would definitely, you know, pop the caps and draw it up because that's going to take you probably a minute or two to do. Um, and, uh, you know, you may not have that minute or two in somebody who's dying in front of you and stuff like that. Okay. Is it point one and point fifteen? Uh, point one and point five for an adult? No, so it's point three zero. Usually, it's just abbreviated point three milligrams for an adult, and point one five half of it for a kid. I'm going to show it to you all in a second. Okay, so what are people allergic to? Pretty much anything and everything, right? Um, and there's some people that have such bad immune systems that they are allergic to like multiple things, right? So some people are just allergic to one thing. Other people are allergic to multiple things. Some people have to eat it before they have an allergic reaction, or some people have to have it injected into them. Other people could just be in the same room with it, right? So there's no way of knowing, you know, how sensitive or not sensitive somebody is to, uh, you know, to um, the allergen. The allergen means the thing that they're allergic to. So typically it's insects that contain uh, venom. Venom is a poison that insects inject uh, in their prey and the thing that they want to kill or eat. Okay. 
Um, but I mean, you know, you've probably gotten a mosquito bite and it swelled up and it itched. That's all an immune response, right? That's the vasodilation. That is the um, increased capillary permeability. That's all, you know, an immune response. Everything, you know, you can go now after this class and say, okay, you know, I just got, you know, my kid just got bit by a mosquito. I just got bit by a mosquito. And the redness and the swelling and the itchiness, that's all your immune system causing that. But fortunately, you know, with a, a mosquito bite, Okay, you typically, uh, typically people will never have an anaphylactic reaction to it. But with certain other things, especially venoms, okay, that are injected in, whether it be bees or uh, there's certain spiders that have, or scorpions in, you know, in, in the Middle Eastern countries or even out West, um, you know, there's certain types of fish, especially fish that lay at the bottom of water and stuff like that that can inject venoms in you and stuff like that. And foods, we know all kinds of foods, right? We typically say peanuts and milk and, and you know, and all different stuff, but any kind of food people, fish, okay? Um, plants, yes and no. I mean, I really haven't seen too much in the way of plants causing an anaphylactic reaction, but, you know, I mean, think of poison ivy. What's poison ivy? Poison ivy is a, an allergic reaction to the oil that's on a plant, right? Poison sumac, same thing. So, you know, there are people who have reactions that may not re raise the, uh, to the level of an allergic reaction. As far as medications go, aspirin is known to cause allergies, right? So that's why we always make sure a patient has no allergies to aspirin before we give them aspirin in a heart attack. Could you, could you imagine somebody having a heart attack, okay? And then we cause an anaphylactic reaction with aspirin. So we, you know, we don't do that because there's alternatives that they could get to aspirin in the hospital. I mean, aspirin is very, very important in a heart attack, but there's alternatives they could get in the hospital to aspirin that would not cause the allergic reaction that, that you don't carry, um, you know, as EMTs, okay? Uh, antibiotics are another common thing, okay? Now, so one of the things that's interesting with medications is that typically people don't have the allergic reaction immediately in taking the medication because what has to happen? It has to get absorbed. Right? So if you're taking it orally you know, in, in your mouth, it has to get absorbed and get into your bloodstream. But if it was a medication that was injected into them, okay, they could have a very quick reaction. Years ago, when people went for CAT scans with contrast material, they say, in other words, they inject them with a dye to kind of color the area they're trying to do the CAT scan. The, the dye material, the contrast material was made up of um, shellfish, um, I guess, I don't know if what's, what it's from inside the cell, for the blood or whatever it was, but it was high in iodine. And there are people that have allergic reactions to iodine. So it was, it was not uncommon years ago for people that were going to, for a CAT scan with contrast material to have an allergic reaction. Now, the contrast material has very little of that. So it's not so common nowadays for people to have severe allergic reactions. Okay. And then, you know, does anything, I mean, you could, you could, you've probably seen with your kids, your wife ch changes the uh, detergent, the soap or the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the washing machine soap, or even the soap that the kids clean themselves with. And then the kid all of a sudden gets red and itchy um, and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that people can be allergic to, but the question is, does it rise to the level of anaphylaxis? Now, the things that most likely, most of the times make people have anaphylaxis are venoms from insects, bees typically, okay, certain foods, okay, and again, certain medications. Those would be the certain, the things that are pretty, um, you know, pretty common to cause those problems. Okay, but like I said, somebody could have never been exposed to something and still have an allergic reaction. Um, so somebody just asked about latex allergies. So latex is a byproduct of rubber, right? So when we originally had uh, gloves, they were all made out of what's called latex, which was made from rubber. The same thing tires are made from and, and different things, right? Uh, there's trees, rubber trees, and that's what they're, they're made from. Um, what happened was um, probably about 15, maybe 20 years ago, um, healthcare workers started having very severe allergic reactions to latex, okay? So nowadays, none of the gloves that you will see in hospitals, on ambulances, anything like that, are contain any latex, okay? So it's just, in fact, there's nothing in medicine that a patient will touch or a healthcare provider will touch that contains latex anymore. You know, there was a time where parts of the IV um, were latex, you know, parts of the IV catheters were latex, but nothing, there's no more latex in medicine uh, anymore, okay? So, and if they had, I mean, let's say there's only, I, there, I should say there never is. I mean, so let's say there is something that the only way they could make it is with latex. You know, one of the things they would have to make sure is that the patient has no allergies to latex before they could use it on that patient. Um, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. But 
Um, there are latex gloves still being made. So there are people, you know, who may use them for cleaning around the house um, and everything like that. But latex tended to be much more expensive than the nitro gloves that we, you know, we get now. And the nice thing about latex gloves is that they, they kind of stuck to your hands. They molded to your hands. So you had a very, very good sense of touch and feel with them. And the new gloves you see are kind of like floppy and they don't, you know, unless you really put on a very, very small pair and then, you know, they rip if they're very small when you put them on and they're, they, you know, it's hard to get them on. So the gloves we use nowadays don't have that nice tight fit to them anymore, but the latex gloves used to have a, a, a beautiful fit to them. In fact, I, I remember when we had to switch from away from latex, the success rate on IVs for the first month or so was horrible because, you know, nobody was used to starting IVs with these floppy loose gloves on them where you couldn't really feel and, and get a good sense of where the vein was and everything like that. And, you know, like anything, if you do it enough times, you, you get used to it. And that's what, uh, that's what wound up happening with it. So again, you don't have to worry about latex, but patients will tell you, you know, please don't touch me with anything that has latex uh, because I have severe reactions to it. And you could just tell them there's nothing anymore, you know, that we carry, you know, in the field that has latex, there's nothing in the hospital anymore that has latex, but it's a good idea to continue to let people know that you have latex allergies, because who knows, I mean, you can go into some doctor's office where, I don't know, you know, that somebody was buying gloves and they got a good deal on latex, they didn't know the difference and stuff like that, and, and they bought them, right, so it's always a good idea, um, you know, for the people to tell you. Okay, so again, when somebody's having, and, and remember, we're really talking about anaphylaxis, even though it keeps on saying an allergic reaction, I'm gonna go back and, and change this on, but there's no way to predict, right? In other words, how severe somebody's reaction is going to be, okay? Or either are some people that have delayed reactions, right? There are people that have, have, they're stung by the bee and nothing happens. It doesn't happen for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, and they have a delayed response. That's still, if they're having life-threatening problems, still anaphylaxis. There's even the situation where somebody gets stung by a bee, they have a severe allergic reaction immediately, we come and treat them, we take them to the hospital, they're continued treated in the hospital, you know, and everything goes well for them. They're watched, typically, somebody who has a severe allergic reaction is watched for about three hours in the emergency department after they're better, just to make sure, okay? And then they send them home on steroids to stop it from happening again. But there's cases where, okay, people like took their own EpiPen and felt better, so they didn't go to the hospital. Or even there's cases where people did go to the hospital and a day later, hours later, whatever, they have a second response. And what it typically means is that the thing that they were allergic to is still floating around in their body and the drugs that we gave them to treat them are gone. And most of the times that's that very second re uh, reaction is caused by venoms because venoms stay in the body for a long period of time. Again, venoms are what's injected into the body by certain insects, snakes, certain fish, and stuff like that. So they last a very, very long time in the body. And if they last longer than the drugs that were given to the patient to reverse the anaphylaxis, the patient could have the anaphylaxis again. Okay, so that's just to realize. So again, there could be somebody stung by a bee, they have immediate allergic reactions, somebody stung by a bee, they have the reaction with five minutes later, there's somebody who's stung by a bee, they have it 30 minutes later, there's somebody stung by a bee, they have an hour later, two hours later. And then there's the one where they were stung by the bee, they had immediate reactions, they were treated, they even went to the hospital, they were even treated in the hospital, they went home and they get it again within 24 hours, okay? We just treat them exactly the same way they were treated the first time. Now, what do you see when somebody has, okay, signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction? So we're gonna go by body systems. So the first one we'll talk about is the skin, okay? Now, skin symptoms alone does not qualify as anaphylaxis, okay? But it may start to, depending on the level of them, say, okay, this is not going well, I'm gonna get ready to treat them. So you have itchy skin, okay, we've all experienced that. And I'll show you what hives look like, but hives are basically raised skin that's caused by plasma leaking out of the capillaries and getting trapped under the skin. The medical term, okay, for hives is urticaria. And just remember, I, I don't care if you can pronounce it, but just remember what it looks like because it is on the test certain times, okay? The skin, because of the vasodilation, gets red and flushed, okay? And it even gets warm because of the vasodilation. The reason it gets warm is because, again, you're bringing the warm blood to the surface, okay? Now, when I was saying about things that may make you say, okay, even though it's a skin symptom, I'm starting to think this may not be going well. When you start seeing the lips swell, the eyelids swell, okay, um, you know, and, and stuff like that around the face, 
you have to assume it's also going on inside the tongue swelling and stuff like that. Again, they get this warm tingly feeling. It's all the vasodilation, okay? Face, mouth, chest, and stuff like that. A lot of times it's just the hands and the feet. We're not as concerned, but once it starts going to the face, the tongue, the mouth, and stuff like that, we get a little more concerned, okay? So, you know, here's a kid. If you really look carefully, his whole face is red. His neck is red, right? I don't know how it's coming out on your screen, but I'll just tell you what we're seeing. One eyelid is starting to swell a little more than the other one, okay? I don't see any real big swelling around his lips and stuff like that, but this is kind of a person who's having, you know, definitely starting to have skin symptoms of anaphylaxis. And the fact that his neck is getting all red would start to say to me, okay, the minute this guy starts saying, you know, it's a little hard to swallow, it's a little hard to breathe, it feels itchy down there, it feels tight down there, I'm going to go ahead and give him the epinephrine. I'm not going to take a chance, okay? Again, if you can't see these, I don't know how your pictures are coming out and stuff, but these are the hives, okay? So just let me know if they're not coming out and, you know, I'll try to figure out a different way of showing it. Now, hives can appear a lot of different ways, okay? But it's basically blotchy, you know, areas of skin that's red and raised. Now, obviously, this is on somebody who's light-skinned and Caucasian, so it's easier, um, uh, it's easier to, you know, see it than in somebody who would be dark skinned, right? Hold on one second, I just have to. Um, so it's definitely harder to see signs of anaphylaxis on dark skinned people is what I'm basically trying to say. Okay, so now we go off the skin, right? We talked about the skin symptoms. Now we're gonna go to respiratory, okay? So breathing types of problems. So they're gonna feel a tightness, a swelling, an itchiness, okay? Um, tingling. They're in their throat, in their chest. Okay. They may develop a cough, but not a cough like when somebody's sick with like bronchitis, right? It's not a, a hacking type of cough. Usually it's actually usually a very weak cough. Okay. Their breathing is going to increase and their lung sounds, if they have bronchoconstriction would be wheezing and their upper airway sound, okay, would be strider if their larynx is starting to um, tighten. If you hear their voice getting very deep, especially a woman who doesn't typically have a deep voice, that's all telling you that the larynx is starting to swell, okay? Um, if they're getting very quiet when they speak, if, they, if you can't hear them when they speak, that's just telling you that everything is starting to swell, okay? Somebody asked, where's the flush skin come from? The vasodilation, right? The flush skin comes from the vasodilation because you're bringing blood right? You're dilating the blood vessels on the surface of the skin and you're bringing the blood up to the surface of the skin so that it looks red and flushed, right? Because of that. And that's why it's warm, okay? Um, and that's why the blood pressure is dropping because you're sending all the important blood from the center of the body out to the skin, okay? Now, what happens cardiac-wise? So the heart rate starts to increase as a compensatory mechanism, right? Because person's scared. They feel like they can't breathe. The blood pressure drops because of the vasodilation that's occurring, okay? And that's the shock component of it. In the stomach, the gastrointestinal, okay? First of all, not everybody gets GI symptoms. It's usually if they ate the thing that's causing the allergic reaction, okay? But there are people who will only have problems with their stomach and then progress on to dropping their blood pressure. So if you go to someone and says, I ate some fish that I didn't know was in my food, okay, and my stomach feels horrible, it, even though they're not complaining about trouble breathing does not mean they may not have a problem. So in that case, you're going to want to get repeat blood pressures on them. And one of the problems we have is that most people don't know what their blood pressure is. So you're going to take a blood pressure and you're going to have nothing to compare it to, right? So that first blood pressure, unfortunately, you know, if it's low to start with, you don't know if that means, you know, it's low for them or that's what it always is, unless they have signs and symptoms. In other words, they're telling you to feel weak or dizzy or something like that. So GI complaints are not that common, okay? But if it's the problem, if the allergen, the thing they're allergic to is something they ate, okay, then they're gonna have those. Again, they could have nausea where they feel like they're gonna throw up. They could be throwing up. They could feel like their stomach is cramping or hurting and getting tight. They could have diarrhea. So it really depends on, you know, everybody is, can have all of them or one of them or stuff like that. Okay, some other just generalized things, they get itchy, watery eyes, they get a headache from the vasodilation, not getting enough blood up to the brain, their nose, they might start running, their mouths, they might start drooling. The impending sense of doom, that, so when people are dying, whether it be heart attack, you know, whatever it is, there are people who actually sense that and, and can verbalize that, like, I don't feel like I'm going to stay awake anymore. And then there's other people who 
are kind of nervous Nellies and they're really not that bad. And they feel like I'm dying, you know, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. So, um, you know, it's kind of, that comes with experience to kind of, you know, know who, who is kind of legit and who's just a nervous person. And, you know, they're probably not dying on you or anything like that. I'm not saying you would discount it and, and tell them, you know, we're leaving you home and stuff like that, but you kind of get a sense of the ones that are a little more um, legitimate. Now, as far as signs and symptoms of them going into shock, it's all the typical signs and symptoms that you would see in somebody going into shock, right? So again, their mental status is going to start to decrease up to including unconsciousness. What means impending doom? Impending doom means they feel like they're going to die, right? That's the term, I'm sorry, the term impending doom. They're saying to you, I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like I cannot stay awake anymore. You know, I feel like I'm going to become unconscious. I feel like I'm dying. So it's always a tough, you know, decision. Is it, is it something real or is it just like, you know, nervousness? There's a medical term, hypochondriac, hypochondria. That means people that are have a, a, a mental condition where they blow everything, you know, out of proportion and stuff like that. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to tell the difference in that. Um, so do you have enough time to listen to lung sounds and somebody's having an allergic reaction? Somebody asked. So that's a great question. Um, I would say that it depends on how quickly the symptoms are occurring. If you walk up to somebody and they're turning blue, they tell you they got stung by a bee and they can't breathe, they can't talk to you, you're not probably going to listen to a set of lung sounds because it's not going to change your treatment. In other words, if they have no lung sounds, if they're wheezing, if they have strider, what, what do you care at this point? You know, they got stung by a bee, they're telling you they can't breathe. Um, you're going to treat them. But, you know, when it's the more milder symptoms, then yes, I would say definitely I would listen to some lung sounds. Of course, the other thing you have to realize if somebody is so tight, if their airways are so tight, you're not going to be able to hear lung sounds, right? Because to be able to hear lung sounds, air has to be traveling in and out of the lungs. So if they're so tight and they're so far along in their problem that they're, you know, they're constricted so tightly, they're not going to be moving any air. You're not going to hear any any lung sounds. So that's obviously a very dangerous sign. If they're not making moving any air, they're going to die, but yet you're not going to hear any abnormal lung sounds. So, okay. So again, all the typical signs and symptoms we talked about with shock, but the only thing that's going to be different here is that initially, because of all the vasodilation, okay, they're going to have really basically flushed red skin. Okay. And they may actually have somewhat decent radio pulses, distal pulses. Usually when somebody goes into shock, we say that they lose those distal pulses, right? Because their blood pressure is dropping. But this is a problem with vasodilation, right? So initially, if you know, if you're there just when they start moving into shock, their skin might actually be warm and flushed. Okay. But if you get there later when they're actually truly in shock, they would have the same pool, uh, pale, cool, clammy, diaphoretic skin like anybody who goes into shock. So it's just a it's just a matter of timing on when you would see you know, see whether you'd see them with flush dry skin or pale cool skin, but you should recognize that early on in anaphylaxis, okay, the, typically the skin is warm, it is flushed. And if you get to somebody who's only having breathing problems and not having any problems with their blood pressure, that's how their skin's going to be the whole time because their blood pressure is fine. They're actually going to do better when you give them the epinephrine because they have a good blood pressure. So the blood pressure is going to be able to circulate and, you know, get to work right away, excuse me, versus somebody whose blood pressure is low. And it's going to take longer for um, the medication to be absorbed and start to work. Okay. So we said, how do we distinguish between somebody just, you know, maybe having a mild allergic reaction, some itchy skin versus somebody dying of anaphylaxis. So I'm right now that weighs heavily on you. Uh, but in real life, it's, it's the person who's having a mild allergic reaction is going to be conversing with you, talking with you saying they feel itchy, probably scratching their skin. The person who's in anaphylaxis is dying, okay? They're turning blue, right? They're, they're gasping for air. They're frantic. They're nervous. So it, it's, it's not like some calm person saying, oh, you know, I got stung by a bee. It hurts, and, you know, my skin's a little itchy, right? That's, a, that's an allergic reaction. Somebody in anaphylaxis, it's going to be clear to you that they're dying, that something bad is going on. The problem is that right now you have not seen sick patients, okay? And you don't have a lot of experience with assessing patients. So it's, this is, you know, this is something that comes with time and experience, you know, to get comfortable, you know, being able to assess patients and figure out what's going on and everything like that. Okay. Frank, a question. If you go, uh, if you get called to a allergic reaction and you only have hives and itching and you take lung sounds and you hit a wheezing, 
then is that going to be an indication for for epinephrine, or you've got to wait the patient to complain? No, if you if you truly hear wheezing. Okay, so again, let's go backwards. So if the patient has a history of anaphylaxis, I would still ask them what usually happens, okay, and kind of be guided by that. And you could say to them, I hear a little wheezing, do you usually have that? If they say yes, you know, I usually have wheezing and, you know, maybe I would treat them, yes. If the patient has no previous history of anaphylaxis, was stung by a bee or ate something, and they're starting to wheeze, I would treat them. Yeah, wheezing is a sign of bronchoconstriction. Right? It's, the, it's the sound we hear when somebody has bronchoconstriction. So they clearly have airway problems at that point. So, um, and it would be pretty weird that they would be wheezing and not being complaining of difficulty breathing. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's not common for somebody to wheeze and not have trouble breathing. So if they're wheezing and they're saying to you, no, my breathing's fine, I'm absolutely, I would just wonder if they're really wheezing or you're hearing something else. So you know, if you're 100% certain they're wheezing, Okay, I would think the patient would have a complaint of some type of breathing problem. If that's the case, I would go ahead and treat them with it. Okay, and remember, who, who do you have to be most cautious with? You have to be most cautious typically with people over the age of 40, 45, especially if they have history of heart problems. You know, we're talking about a, a 21 year old kid, no, no heart problems and stuff like that. And, you know, he gets stung by a bee, he's got some, you know, generalized complaints of trouble breathing. I wouldn't really be very concerned about treating him with epinephrine. Okay, because he's probably has a young, healthy heart and stuff like that. It's really the older people that we're very concerned about, you know, with, uh, with treating with epinephrine. Okay, somebody wrote, patient doesn't necessarily need to have a history of allergic reactions. Correct. Yes, you're absolutely correct. In other words, we said that there could be the case where somebody's stung by a bee. And even though they swear to you up and down that they've never been stung by a bee before, they could still have an allergic reaction. Okay, probably what happened was they were stung by a bee. They were probably very young. They didn't know it. They don't remember it. Okay, but doesn't matter if they got stung. If they tell you they got stung by a bee, if they tell you they uh, I don't know they they ate a peanut, you know, and and they have a they had a severe allergic reaction, um, you know, uh, classified as anaphylaxis. Then yes, you would go ahead and treat them. Okay, if symptoms seem to be mild with some wheezing, would you rather put them on oxygen? Oxygen is not going to help wheezing. So the only two medications that are gonna help wheezing would be epinephrine and albuterol. So if somebody was only wheezing, their blood pressure was fine, and their only complaint was maybe some mild wheezing, some mild shortness of breath. And I would, you could try some albuterol to start with, okay? It's not usually the way we go. If somebody's wheezing, we would usually give them epinephrine, but if they have no other complaints, okay, and their blood pressure is good, and you know they have no history of severe anaphylaxis, you could definitely try some albuterol. But remember, albuterol will not work unless the patient's breathing adequately because for albuterol to work, they have to be able to breathe it down into their alveoli so it crosses over into their pulmonary capillaries. Okay, so, um, but yes, you could, you could, if the only complaint was some mild wheezing, you could technically give them some, um, some albuterol versus the epinephrine. Okay, so again- If it's, our, just, if it's just wheezing, you don't know if it's uh, anaphylaxis or asthma. Well, but again, you're talking about there's a story that's making you think that it's anaphylaxis, right? They got stung by a bee. They ate something they shouldn't have eaten. You know, asthma, do people typically have a history of asthma? I've, I've not yet gone to someone, okay? You know, and I've been doing this since 1985-ish. Um, I've not gone to a person who's having an asthma attack who did not know they had asthma. Just never had. I never had somebody with a new onset of asthma, okay? You know, like the first time um, they've ever had asthma. Every single patient, you know, talking hundreds of patients, knew they had asthma, okay? And, you know, they said, what's the problem? Having trouble breathing. What kind of medical problems do you have? Asthma. Okay, you know, were you trying to treat yourself? What did you take? You know, so all the time it's been that kind of story. Um, is it possible that you're the first person that they, you know, that come upon them when they had their first asthma attack? Yes, but just not so very likely. Remember, asthma is only gonna have wheezing. Anaphylaxis has strider, anaphylaxis has ah hives, anaphylaxis has itchiness, anaphylaxis has vasodilation, anaphylaxis has uh, warm, um, flush skin, right? Asthma just is a problem with wheezing and breathing, right? So it's pretty easy to tell the difference. So if somebody comes to you and says, you know, um, uh, I was just sitting here, okay, and I don't know, maybe um, I was exercising and uh, now all of a sudden I feel like I'm wheezing, I can't catch my breath. 
and they have no hives and no other signs and symptoms, you're right. It's probably just some type of bronchoconstriction problem, which 99.9% .9 of the time is asthma. Okay. Um, but if they say to you, you know, Did we lose your voice or was it just me? You had an attack, maybe. We can't hear you. Can you hear us? We can't hear anything. Maybe it's out of I'm light. Here. I'm here. Speaker has changed. How about now? Yeah, there you go. Nope. Okay. Better or worse? We're good. Sounds good. Okay, because it switched to the computer. Uh, let's see. Your default speaker has changed to speakers. No, it went back to the headset now. Um, are you still hear me? Yep. Okay. YouTube gives a video that an instructor started to have chest pain while he was teaching paramedics and no one got up to, to help him. So he said then, so why do I teach you? <laughs> um, listen, I've had some pretty wild stuff uh, happen in class. I had a, a, a guy, very dedicated student, never missed a class, always early, always asked questions and everything like that. He comes to class, he looks horrible. And um, he says, you know, listen, he goes, uh, I feel horrible. I never felt this sick in my life, um, but I didn't want to not come to class. And I said, okay, go out to your car and go home. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll have somebody follow you just to make sure you get home. Okay. Or do you want somebody to drive you? You know, cause he really looks sick. No, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. If I don't feel like I can drive, I'll call my wife to come get me. So we, uh, we send him on his way. Okay. You know, he leaves class and stuff like that. And I mean, the other reason too, is you don't want that person to infect everybody else in class. Right. That's another issue. But, um, anyway, like after, I don't know, an hour or so gave the, uh, class, a class, a break. And, um, I said to one of his friends, I said, just, you know, go out and make sure, give him a call, make sure he got home. Okay. You know, and all this stuff. Well, the kid comes running back in and says his car is still here. So we all go out figuring his wife took him home, but we all go out and he's laying on the front seat of his car, not responding, banging on the window, not responding and everything like that. He turned out to have meningitis. So he thankfully he had vi viral meningitis, not bacterial meningitis, but uh, you know, he had meningitis and he was out cold inside the car. So, you know, thank God I gave them a break after an hour and not three hours, but uh, you know, we wound up calling an ambulance, having him go to the hospital and everything like that. I had another uh, gentleman who was, when we were doing lifting practice, you know, lifting the stretchers and stuff like that. He all of a sudden said to me, I think I have a problem with my eye. And he actually uh, detached his retina in his eye when he was lift lifting. So we, we've had some, you know, interesting things happen. When I was teaching a paramedic class uh, years ago at Westchester Community College, I had a girl who was every other day, not coming to class, had some kind of medical problem every other day, not coming to class, you know? So again, it was an hour or two before class. She calls me up. I'm not, not feeling well, but this time her voice had something in it. But again, I didn't know if she was being an actress or whatever. So I said to her, listen, you got to make a decision. Either you come into class or, you know, that's it. You're done. So class and I hung up and class starts. I come downstairs. She's there. So I was like, okay. And then start teaching. It was a big lecture hall type of place, you know, so it was a little hard to see everybody up close, but um, I noticed that she clearly seems like she's struggling and uh, she turned out to have epiglottitis. You don't know what that is yet. We'll talk about that in another night or two when we could start doing peds, but she turned out to have uh, epiglottitis. So I've had some, you know, interesting things uh, occur, you know, with the class. I had somebody, we were practicing um, IVs in a paramedic class and I had a group of uh, six or seven people that were going to be missionaries to Africa. And um, they wanted to be able to provide healthcare and immunizations and all this stuff to the people they were going to, uh, to minister to. So they wanted to learn how to do IVs and injections. So they decided to take a paramedic class. And this guy was practicing IVs on another student back in the day when we did it that way. And uh, as soon as he got some blood, he fainted from the side of the blood. But on his way down, he hit his face on the table and cut his chin, broke his nose, blood everywhere. So I was like, oh, my God, I got a lot of people, paperwork to do on this one. So, OK, so somebody asked a question of striders and upper airway and wheezing lower airway. Absolutely. Strider is your larynx. Very good. OK. And wheezing is your bronchioles. So strider is up here, OK, in your throat because your larynx is the top of your trachea. 
Wheezing is your bronchioles, which are the ends, uh, um, the end tubes right before the alveoli. So, um, and again, uh, upper airway would be strider, lower airway would be um, uh, bronchioles would be wheezing, and strider is a primary inspiratory sound, so you mainly hear it when they're breathing in, and wheezing is a primary expiratory sound, so you usually hear it when they're exhaling out. Okay, um, yes, and there is definitely some advantages of Zoom, which is that we do it from the comfort of our own home, but there's a lot of disadvantages of, uh, of Zoom. So, um, Okay, so we know that in our primary server, we're supposed to look for life-threatening uh, problems and treat them in the order that we find them. And in this case, anaphylaxis, true anaphylaxis is gonna have problems with airway, with breathing and circulation, right? And But we have a wonderful drug that kind of takes care of all those problems at the same time. The problem, again, is the side effect of that drug, which is epinephrine, obviously. So again, history-wise, do they have a previous history of allergic reactions to anything? Okay, try to find out what was the patient exposed to? Okay, how were they exposed to? Did they eat it? Was it injected into them either by an uh, insect or by you know maybe getting a shot at the doctor's office and stuff like that? We know with the COVID vaccine, right, there's been some isolated cases of people having anaphylaxis from the... Um, the vaccine, you know, very, very, very small amount of people, you know, probably at this point, less than 100 people, considering how many millions of people have gotten it already. Uh, but, um, you know, that's always a possibility, right? Okay, and then we're going to look for the different signs and symptoms, the, the hives, the urticaria, the red skin and stuff like that. Is it progressing? Or is it getting better? Right? And then what do we do as far as interventions go? Or what did the patient do? Did the patient maybe take some Benadryl? Did the patient take their own EpiPen? Right? These are all things that we have to know. If the patient took their own EpiPen, and they're not feeling any better, then it's one of two things, or one of three things. One, the Epi was expired in their EpiPen. So you're going to look at the expiration date. Maybe they didn't do it right. Okay. Or maybe it's real severe, and they need a second shot. Right. So but but it would be good to know if they did treat themselves because, you know, we don't want to necessarily give them more epi than they need to uh, need to get. OK, what's the amount of epi we can give? Um, Yankee is asking me to tell you guys that you need to get your FEMA courses in. Right. Your your um, ICS classes and your hazmat classes. They're overdue, okay? And you need to have those done to be able to take the state exam. So please get them in as soon as you can. And also make sure you take all the quizzes that I've sent out. I'm sorry, now, what was your um, question? Um, how many times could, could we give epi? To so we're gonna go over all that, but you can give two doses of epinephrine on standing order, okay? Technically- So that's technically. offline? Yep, standing order means you give it on your own say-so, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, baseline set of vitals, somebody's dying, you don't need to get them, right? If it's a mild allergic reaction, absolutely, okay? Somebody dying of, in fact, it actually says in the state protocol that the only time you don't have to get consent to treat someone is if they're dying of anaphylaxis because, you know, there may be no way of getting, um, you know, a uh, consent from someone if they can't talk to you. And it also says that you could defer a complete patient assessment on somebody dying of anaphylaxis because there would be, you know, so so you spend five minutes doing a complete patient assessment, a complete set of vital signs, everything's perfect, but yet you didn't treat the patient in that period of time and now they die. So, you know, you have to realize it really can happen that quickly, not all the time, but it can definitely happen quickly. Okay, so oxygen is important, okay? Um, again, somebody who's just having a modeler reaction with some itchiness doesn't necessarily need oxygen, you're not gonna hurt them. Um, but again, somebody just having some itchy skin, if their pulse ox is above 94%, probably doesn't need some oxygen. Um, but if you want to put it on them, it's not a huge deal and stuff like that. Now, the problem with somebody who's having severe trouble breathing is that the oxygen mask itself over their face, okay, may make them actually feel like, you know, you're kind of suffocating them because I don't know if you got to actually put oxygen masks on each other in class. I asked them to do that for you, but I don't know if you actually got to do that, but you'll notice that there's not a lot of, you don't feel a lot of flow of oxygen. Like you don't feel like the oxygen is being forced into you. So with somebody who's just short of breath and you put this mask over their face, they kind of feel like it's stopping them from taking a deep breath. Okay. Now, obviously if somebody's gotten to the point where they're not breathing, you would have to ventilate them, but just recognize this is going to be a very, very hard patient to ventilate because if all their airways are constricted and tightened and you're taking that bag valve mask and trying to squeeze it into them, it's going to be very hard to get airway into any air into them because the place the air has to go is all constricted. So you may have the issue where now instead of air going into their lungs, into their chest, it's actually going into their esophagus and their stomach because you can't force it into their trachea. You can't force it into their bronchioles because of the, 
the laryngospasm, you know, the strider and the bronchoconstriction, the wheezing and stuff like that. So now I've only had, you know, again, in all these years, two patients in anaphylaxis that were like dying when I got there. Okay. And again, I go through most pretty much all the real serious calls. I review them. So it's not like we see this too, too often um, where somebody has it. And people who have a history of having, you know, anaphylaxis typically have their own EpiPens and typically treat themselves before we get there. And most of the times treat themselves successfully. Okay. It's only when people forget their EpiPens, you know, at home and don't have them and stuff like that, where you, you run into a problem. And that does happen, you know. I mean, it was a case on Lake George a summer or two ago where a doctor who knew he had anaphylaxis took his two little daughters out in a rowboat, or I don't know if it was a rowboat, some type of boat, got stung by a bee and died in front of him because he left his EpiPen in the hotel room. So, you know, it does happen where people forget their EpiPens uh, or they don't change them out when they're supposed to and they're not good anymore and stuff like that. Okay, so again, the best way to give epinephrine is by what they call an auto injector, which is a device that automatically injects the medication into them once you remove the safety and press it up against them. That's the quickest way, um, you know, to be able to do it. Uh, and I'll show you the two different ways that we do it now and stuff like that. Okay, so again, auto injectors are the best way to do it. And epinephrine is reserved for the patient who's having a severe allergic reaction that we call anaphylaxis. It's having some thing that's indicating that they're having some type of respiratory complaint or that they, you know, it, it happened, boom, one, two, three, and they're already, they can't breathe. They dropped their blood pressure and they're dying, right? So it could be either way. It could be that they, they're just starting into it, but they're having respiratory problems and you're going to treat them before they get worse. Or it could be that it happens so quick that by the time you get there, they're already, uh, they're already dying and stuff like that. Okay. Now, uh, somebody who's gotten a shot of epinephrine, as long as their blood pressure was still good, will probably start feeling um, good almost immediately. Okay. I would say within a minute, they're going to start feeling some reversal of the symptoms that cause you to give the EpiPen. It really does work that quick. Okay. Um, but if it doesn't, right, then you have the ability to give a second EpiPen. Now the protocol does say 10 minutes between EpiPens. Um, I don't know that we would wait a whole 10 minutes, but I would clear, I mean, the time you give it and give it a little time for it to work, I would say you're probably close to the five minute mark. And if it didn't make them feel much better at the five minute mark, then I would assume that there's some kind of, you know, there's something going on with the patient that they need a second, a second dose of epinephrine. Okay. Okay. So again, anytime we give a medication, we have to reassess them. Okay. Just recheck their blood pressure and all that type of stuff. Okay. Um, so it says, should you administer an auto injector for a simple allergic reaction? So I think at this point we know no, right? Somebody who's just a little itchy, has some hives, does not get epinephrine, okay? But it has to be that they have some complaint of severe um, or start some complaint of starting to have trouble breathing, or maybe they just have that history of that they almost die every time they're exposed to their allergen. And in that case, we're not going to wait, right? So they tell us, you know, yeah, no, really now it's not too bad, but every time this happens to me, you know, within five minutes, my throat closes, please treat me, we would treat them, you know, because they have that history. And you would just document, you know, the patient relates history of, you know, uh, severe anaphylaxis with, you know, uh, with the laryngeal constriction every time. Um, and we went ahead and treat them with epinephrine. Okay, so let's talk about the epi now. Okay, so self administer epinephrine means that the patient is carrying their epinephrine, okay, to treat themselves. If for some reason the patient did not do it and we feel they need to have it done, we can go ahead and use their EpiPen. I caution you that the, we know every ambulance has to have EpiPens of their own. I would just caution you to realize that patients are not so good about keeping it in the right climate, the right temperature. So again, sometimes it may not be good. So you're always gonna look at the expiration date and you're always gonna look at, there's a window on the side of the EpiPen that you could look into and the fluid, you, you're actually looking at the epinephrine, the fluid should be clear. So if you see it discolored or you see anything floating in it, you'd have to assume that it's been damaged by you know, exposure to high temperature or low temperature, okay? So what is epinephrine, epinephrine? The ones in the back of the Tula cars are also not uh, healthy. Yeah, absolutely. It's the biggest problem in the world. I mean, I bring in every night, okay, all my medication bags. And I leave them right by the door because when I didn't leave them right by the door, I used to leave in the morning without them, but I bring them, I leave them and I leave them right there this way, you know, they're inside and they're, you know, it's fine for them to be at 60 degrees 
It's when they start going 50, 40, 30 that it's a problem. Um, you could gain a little bit of use uh, by putting them in like, a, you ever see those soft-sided cooler bags? So that will give you, a, you know, probably a couple more hours of temperature control, um, you know, both in the summer and the winter, even without an ice pack in them. The only other thing you could do um, with medications is then switch them out every 30 days. Like we carry a medication called Cardizem that has to be refrigerated. Now we don't have refrigerators. So, you know, in every paramedic truck. So what we do is every 30 days, you just switch them out because that's what the manufacturer said they're good for unless they're kept refrigerated. Uh, but that obviously becomes pricey, but uh, you know, that's, but that's how we choose to do it with the, uh, with the uh, Cardizem. But now the comp one, a new company came out with a way of, they have a Cardizem as a powder where it's a two vials connected. One is the powder and one is the sterile water and you twist them, the water goes into the powder, you shake it up and you draw it up. So that way it does not need to be refrigerated anymore and it lasts for two years that way. So it's a, it was a new way they developed it. But you're right, that's a big problem. It's a big, big problem with medications being left in uh, vehicles and stuff like that. And uh, there are actually um, little disposable thermometers that you could put in with the medications and they don't tell you the temperature. They just change colors. If the temperature goes below a certain temperature or above a certain temperature, the piece of paper turns a certain color and tells you that it was exposed to either too high or too low of a temperature and then you're supposed to discard it. Okay, But it, that definitely is an issue with medications kept in, uh, in vehicles and stuff like that. Um, that's why, you know, technically ambulances are allowed to be kept running if they have medications on board, you know, because uh, technically you're not allowed to idle a vehicle for pollution problems, but an ambulance is allowed to be kept running if it's a matter of keeping the medication um, in a, um, you know, a, 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 the right temperature, okay? Um, now, somebody asked if a patient took their EpiPen, okay, does that mean it counts as one? So again, it depends on, is it of the right expiration date? You know, does it look like it's still good, the medication? And are they starting to feel better, right? If somebody got a shot of epinephrine, you have to assume that their heart rate is going to be over 120 beats per minute because that's what Epi does, right? It makes you very tachycardic. So if somebody took a shot of epinephrine and they're not feeling better and their heart rate is not increasing, it can only be like one, one maybe three things. It could be that they didn't do it right. Somehow they screwed up. Um, that's more of a problem with the new way that we give epinephrine where we have to draw it up ourselves, okay? Or it could be that the medication itself is not good because it's expired or it lost its potency because of temperature. The only other thing is that there is a class of blood pressure medications called beta blockers, B-E-T-A, beta blockers. Um, you may have heard some of them, atenanol, propranolol, indorol, um, metoprolol. Um, your parents may be on it or their grandparents may be on it. It's a, it's a class of blood pressure medication that keeps the blood pressure low by making the heart beat with less force so it's not squeezing as hard and also beat less times a minute. So it's a pretty effective way of controlling blood pressure and it's a very cheap drug. So it's a very commonly prescribed medication, especially if people don't have um, you know, Medicaid where they get their drugs for free and stuff like that. Um, the problem is that epinephrine is a beta drug. Now, just for all, when it says beta, it just talks about receptors. Receptors are where the drugs go to make something happen in the body. So a beta blocker would block a beta drug. So if they're on beta blockers for their blood pressure and you give them epinephrine, which is a positive beta drug, it's not going to work or it's not going to work as effectively. So in that case, you know, giving somebody epinephrine may not work. Now, before you get crazy about it, if their doctor, right, that was going to prescribe the beta blocker was good and doing his job, before he puts them on a beta blocker, he's supposed to ask them, do you have a history of allergies? If they have a history of any allergies, then they cannot be taking beta blockers. Okay, that's just, and actually wouldn't even put them on it for asthma because the drugs would treat these asthma, it would not work and stuff like that. So um, they don't typically put patients on it. Okay, so again, um, if somebody took it, and it was going to work and starting to make them feel better, then yes, we do count it, okay? And then if they don't feel 100% better, we can go ahead and give them our second one. But if they took one and they're feeling better, you know, um, we don't have to give them our second one. So, but if it's a, you know, if it was a correct administration, everything's working properly, yes, you would count it as the first dose of epinephrine. And, and like I said, most of the times, 
you know, people have severe allergic reactions, have taken their own EpiPen and have treated themselves and usually feel fine. Okay. Um, the problem is a lot of times because of that, they don't want to go to the hospital until you point out to them that, you know, they have to get steroids to prevent them from having a second, you know, uh, a second case of it. And you don't, you can't give them steroids, right? We, you know, in other words, they need to get that in the hospital. They need a, a dose of it IV. And then they go home on a seven day pack where each day they're taking a little less of it. Um, so, and they probably know that because, you know, if they've had it, they probably had situations where they've gone to the hospital uh, before. If someone, if someone has a, um, a, a beta blocker mm -hmm. and, uh, he has an allergic reaction, can you give him antihistamine? Well, you don't carry antihistamines and antihistamines are just going to make patients comfortable. It's not going to reverse it. In other words, you see here where it says, what does epinephrine do? It constricts blood vessels. So it raises the blood pressure and it dilates the bronchioles and also dilates the larynx. So it makes their breathing better. So antihistamines don't do any of that. In other words, if somebody's truly having anaphylaxis, the things that are killing them are the bronchodilation, okay, and the vasodilation. I'm sorry, the bronchoconstriction and the vaso and the, I'm sorry, the vasodilation, the bronchoconstriction. So you need to give them a drug that does both of those things, that reverses both of those things. And epinephrine is actually the drug that does that. So that's the issue, um, you know, that we, uh, we have with that. So, you know, and again, we don't carry antihistamines and an oral dose of Benadryl is not going to work quick enough. So like, you know, taking some Benadryl is fine if you have a, a bee sting and it's itchy, you know, but we're not talking about somebody who's got some itchy skin. We're talking about somebody who's dying again of anaphylaxis. You have to remember, we're talking about life-threatening problems, not uncomfortable problems. So antihistamines- I understand, that's why I'm asking, is there any alternative that you could use if someone has allergic reaction with beta blockers? What uh, do you do a, sec a second dose of epinephrine. The first dose doesn't work, you give them more. Mm -hmm. So this would be a situation where you would actually have to call medical control and say, you know, we gave them a first dose of epi, nothing happened. We waited five to 10 minutes. We gave them a second dose. They're not really feeling better. We're, we're still got 10, 15 minutes before we get to you. Can we go ahead and give them a third dose? And you would have to say to them, you know, the patient is on, you know, a tenor or whatever, the patient's on a beta blocker every day for their high blood pressure. And we think this is why they're not getting tachycardic, why they're not feeling any better from the epinephrine, right? Because if they're, if they get epi and they're not getting tachycardic, it's gotta be a problem with either the epi not being of the, you know, the right strength anymore, or with, um, you know, they're on a beta blocker or maybe somehow the, you know, the, you drew it up wrong. If you're doing the one that where it draws up or something like that, I'll show you what the issue is in a second with that. Okay, so we have two ways we can carry epinephrine. The best way is the auto injector. The reason we don't do that is the expense of it, right? A two pack of an auto injector is six, 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 seven hundred dollars. The average ambulance throws them out after one year. They have a one year expiration date. So, you know, the average ambulance doesn't ever get to use them, you know, whether it be just that we don't have a lot of anaphylaxis or the paramedics get there and treat them first or the patient treats themselves. So most of the times they just go to waste. Okay. But you're allowed to, you know, either use the patient's auto injector if you think it's still good or use your, the ones that you carry. And again, you're allowed to give up to two doses on standing order. Okay. The second dose is technically 10 minutes after the first dose. Um, just to give you some point of reference, I have only given a second dose of epinephrine once in my life. So it's not common that you have to give a second dose of epinephrine, okay? Um, but when patients get EpiPens, there's always a two pack, there's always two of them in there because it is possible that a patient will need a second dose, okay? It is also possible to use albuterol on standing order. So just like in asthma, you can give up to three doses of albuterol. In anaphylaxis, you can give up to three treatments, you know, three uh, nebulizers of albuterol, okay? Um, but technically in the protocol, it says still wheezing after the epinephrine. So you gave the epinephrine, you stabilized their blood pressure, but they're still wheezing. Okay. So instead of giving them another dose of epi, you could try some albuterol because albuterol will work on the bronchioles. Okay. Not affect the heart as much as the epinephrine would. But again, if their blood pressure didn't stabilize, albuterol does nothing for blood pressure, does not raise blood pressure. So it'd be useless. Albuterol only works for bronchoconstriction. So if the problem is bronchoconstriction, then albuterol is a good drug to give as long as the patient can breathe it in because it's going by a nebulizer, right? They have to be able to suck it in by their mouth. Wasn't one of the symptoms from albuterol getting tachycardia? You can, but not, I mean, if I gave one of you, I gave you, you know, albuterol to suck on, right? 
and let's say it raises your heart rate about 10 points. And then I give you epinephrine, it's going to raise your heart rate probably 30 points. So epinephrine is much more stimulating, much more straining on the heart than albuterol is. But you're right, you will have it. I mean, I don't know if I already told you, you know, I took albuterol once in my life. I had a situation where I got a chest cold, a bronchitis. And, you know, whatever, I was home, I was kind of like, you know, being high maintenance, complaining how trouble, uh, I don't feel good, and I can't breathe. My wife said, why don't you just call the medic truck to come over and give you an albuterol treatment? I said, I'm not having the medics come over and treat me. It's so embarrassing, you know? So I kept on moping around and everything like that. Then I decided I put a coat on and I snuck out and I drove to the paramedic station and I got some albuterol. I got a nebulizer. I had an oxygen tank at home and I came home and I gave myself a nebulizer, right? So I'm sitting in the living room. I give myself a nebulizer. Within 10 minutes, my breathing was 100% better. But that night, I could not go to sleep. I was so shaky and jittery and, and bouncing all over the place. My breathing was great. But from the epinephrine, because it was the, not the epinephrine, from the albuterol, because it was the first time I took it, I had such a crazy response to it. You know, so I was a little tachycardic. And I was, I mean, I'm not getting tachycardic. Kind of, my heart rate was 100. But my heart rate's usually 50 or 60. So you know, I, I was double what it normally is. And I was definitely a little shaky and jittery. And I felt like I could, you know, uh, whatever, you know, walk for miles. I was so wide awake and jittery and stuff like that. So, but it did do a good job on my breathing. Okay. Now, the last thing to remember is that you can call medical control if you've exceeded the two doses of, if you need to exceed the two doses of epinephrine or the three doses of albuterol, but they're going to want to have a reason why. In other words, it's not going to be typical that you have to give people more than one dose of epinephrine. So now when you go to, you're going to give them a third one, it means you gave them the first one and the second one. That's typically not, you know, what they're expecting to hear. So they're going to, you're going to have to really be able to paint a picture on why you have to give them that third dose. And again, a good story, if they're truly on beta blockers would be that they're taking beta blockers, you know, and, and any doctor would understand that. And, you know, in that case, you know, you have to give them enough epinephrine so it works its way past the beta blocker and actually starts to do what it needs to do, which is the, the vasoconstriction to tighten the blood pressure, to, the blood vessels to raise the blood pressure, and the, the bronchodilation to relax the airway and the laryngeal relaxation of the larynx so you can get air in, right? So, but again, rare, you know, just as a point of reference, I, you don't see this happening at all, you know, with any kind of frequency. It's very rare. Okay, so we said the side effects of, of epinephrine, because it increases the heart rate, it makes the heart work so hard, it increases your cardiac workload, which means that it's increasing the amount of oxygen your heart needs. And because you're having anaphylaxis, you can't get that in. And that's the real danger of it. Okay, so what's an auto injector? An auto injector is a device that is a spring loaded syringe that already has the epinephrine in it. And when you press it up against somebody's leg, it injects it into them. It was not designed for EMS. It was designed for a patient to give to themselves if they were dying of anaphylaxis and they would not have time to be able to draw up medication to treat themselves. The military has probably about 20 different medications that they have packaged as auto injectors because it's a quick, simple way to give it. In civilian world, we really basically just have the Epi and because Epi became so expensive because the company that used to make them got bought out by a different company who wanted to, you know, raise the raise a lot of money so their stock is worth more. Uh, it was called Mylan, M Y L A N. Um, you know, they raised the prices. There was a lot of backlash. Uh, the federal government went after them, and they've kind of, you know, started to stabilize the price. There are other Epi auto injectors other than this one, but this was the first one, and it really is the best one. Uh, but there are other ones out there that are much cheaper. They just, you know, they're just not as simple to use um, as the uh, as the EpiPen is. So the yellow EpiPens are the adult ones. The green ones are the pediatric ones. They're always packaged with three, but two of them are actual live ones, and one is a trainer. Okay, so you'll see the trainer, uh, you know, when you guys practice on the weekend, um, the, um, you know, with the different medications and stuff like that. Um, the live ones are actually inside a hard plastic case. It's a little hard to see them, but they're actually packaged inside a hard plastic case. The trainer is outside. The epinephrine, you can see here, has the 0.3 milligrams for the adult and the 0.15 milligrams for the pediatric. 0.15 is actually half of 0.3, right? It's 0.30. So this is 0 0.30, which is half of 0 0.15. Okay, so this is double the dose that's in here. 
Okay, and so two of these together would make up one of these. So, you know, just so you know, if you have an adult having anaphylaxis and the only thing you have is the pediatric ones, two of them would can make one adult one. And also people always ask, what if you only have an adult one and you have a child? Well, if they're truly dying of anaphylaxis, you would have to go ahead and treat them with the adult one because you're not gonna let them die just because you don't have the right, um, you know, the right specific EpiPen, okay? So Frank, again, I don't know. I don't know if you know, but you said that there is a trainer one in the pack. Mm -hmm. This one right here. You see what I'm waving the mouse at? Yeah. These, yeah. Are, these are the trainers. Yeah, David. David said that he had a story. He was once had an allergic reaction. A babysitter called for a child, and the babysitter said that she administered already an EpiPen, the auto injector. Mm -hmm. But you said, let me see which one you gave because nothing changed in the child and she, she gave the trainer one. Well, that was the fault of the parents because you should not have the trainer along with the real ones because that's what happens, right? So um, it's good to have the trainers just so people can practice, but um, you, know, you should really not keep them together because that's what could happen. The other thing is when they expire, I always tell people not to uh, throw them out so the best thing to do is actually have, you know, the patient themselves, especially if it's a young child, practice with it by injecting it in an orange um, just to feel what it kind of feels like. And the other nice thing that's about these EpiPens is it's kind of hard to see, but you see these orange things that are sticking out over here. When, when you press it up against a patient's leg and the needle comes out, as you pull it away from their leg, this orange thing covers the needle so that the patient doesn't see the needle, okay, ever. And also from a safety standpoint, the needle is covered so nobody can accidentally poke themselves with it. But from a psychological standpoint, if the patient were to see how long the needle is, they may be a little hesitant to inject it in themselves. Um, so that's the nice thing about sheathing it. This is the part um, that the, has the patent. So an epi auto injector has been out for so many years, there's no patent on it. So, but the sheathing part of it, of this company is the part that still has the patent. So they're the only ones that have the self-sheathing um, part over it. So that's, you know, that's basically the, um, I guess the only real difference on these versus the, uh, the other ones. Um, so again, you know, um, patients may have them, we, we should be carrying them, but a lot of ambulances have gone away from actual auto injectors because of the cost. Like we don't carry them anymore on our paramedic trucks. You know, we draw up the epinephrine and stuff like that. Okay, so if, you know, a patient having their own auto injector, um, you really don't have to see the prescription. You know, if the patient says it to you that it's theirs, that's fine, but you do wanna check that there's no discolorization and that it's not expired. I don't think we can see, oh, you can see. Like if you look right over here, you see that little rectangular window? Um, that's the window that you would look through and you actually see the syringe of the medication and you could see if it's discolored. So that's where you really look. And the expiration date is usually printed right along over here, okay? So you could see it. Again, they have a one-year um, expiration date just because this was not designed for us. This was designed for patients. So they have to assume that patients don't keep it in the right temperature. So they make it only a one-year expiration date. Now, to be able to use it, okay, um, let's, let's see. I'm going the wrong way. Oh, I screwed up. Hold on. So to be able to use it, now this kind, this is the, the trainer, but um, this is what's called the safety. This pulls straight out. We're not seeing the screen. The oh, you're screen not seeing, oh, screen sharing, I stopped. Okay, my mistake here. Uh... Okay, it's back. Good now. Nope. OK, so even though this is the trainer, OK, it, it looks pretty much like the real one. OK, um, the this part over here, this blue cap over here, this is what's called the safety. This is what you actually press up against the patient's leg. And this is when you press it up against their leg, it's what breaks the seal and the needle plunges out. You don't need to jab it into them. You just need to press it up against their leg firmly till you hear a click sound. And that means you broke the seal and it goes in. 
Um, but it doesn't work unless the safety is out. So this, this whole blue thing pulls right out. And then once it pulls out, it's ready to be used. So if you were to press this right now up against somebody, nothing would happen. But once you pull this out, then it will deploy. OK, and, um, you know, obviously you want to make sure that you do not have your fingers anywhere near where the needle is going to come out, because if you inject this in your finger, you're going to have a problem because of, again, epinephrine causes vasoconstriction and you're going to shut off the blood flow um, to that finger. So that's the issue that you would have there. Hold on one second. OK, um, let's see what else. Now, there's tons of videos. Um, out there, even by the company and stuff like that, that you could see if you have, you know, access to the internet and YouTube and stuff like that. So there's tons to do about, I have tons of auto injectors. I actually have a decent amount of expired EpiPens that we can also practice with. So I will, I'm going to give all those to, uh, to dub it. So I'll have it for you for on Sunday and stuff like that. Okay. So again, you remove the safety cap, right? That's the first step. Well, actually, if it's still in the hard plastic case, you have to take it out of the hard plastic case and then remove the, um, the safety, the um, hold on, somehow screwed up again. Okay. And then you're going to press it up against it. Now, these will work right through patient's clothing. Okay. So if you do not have an exposed piece of skin, it will go right through. Now, the site to put it in, and it'll show you on Sunday, is the lateral side of the upper leg, the lateral side of the thigh, okay, is where you would actually give it. Um, it's kind of like the medius portion. I wouldn't go directly on the side. I'll see now in a second if I could find some better pictures after we finish with the, the PowerPoint um, showing you where, where to give it and stuff like that. And again, you don't need to jab it into them. You just need to press it firmly up against their leg. You'll hear a clicking sound. You hold it in place for another 10, 15 seconds just to make sure all the epinephrine gets in there. You pull it away. It'll self-sheath. Those particular ones will self-sheath. You won't see the needle. Okay, and then you massage the area for a couple seconds just to make the medication uh, get absorbed. Okay, and that's how it basically works. Obviously, we said we were talking about pharmacology that we have the five rights, right? So we have to have good documentation. So we need to document, you know, why we gave it, who we gave it, how much we gave, and stuff like that. Okay, um, and then it is, it is. Um, I did tell them the junkie's telling me to massage. I just said to massage the area after um, you give it for a couple seconds. Okay, um, so somebody's asking, does it go into the skin? or a vein. So what's happening is it's what's called, if you remember when we did the pharmacology, it's called an intramuscular injection, which means that it's injected into the muscle of their leg. Okay. And then obviously the muscle has capillaries, has blood vessels, and it's absorbed from the muscle into those blood vessels and wakes it its way in. It's not an IV medication where it's being injected directly into the vein because that will require much more skill to be able to do that, but it's an intramuscular injection that gets absorbed quickly into the bloodstream and makes its way in there. But it's not obviously as quick as, as starting an IV on somebody and giving the epinephrine directly into the IV, which would go directly into the vein and directly into the bloodstream. But it's quick. It does, it does work pretty quickly. Um, again, these still go in a sharps container, biohazard container, in other words, because it's still a needle. But um, you, know, you don't have a needle actually showing on the one the brand that I've been showing you. Now, there is a different manufacturer where it actually has two doses of epinephrine in an auto injector. Um, and I'll find that for you in a second. But it's only one dose is only an auto injector. The other dose is a tiny little syringe that you can take, unscrew something, and pull it out and actually inject yourself into the patient. Okay. So, again, some patients require more than one dose, not so common. You are allowed to give up to two doses. After two doses, okay, you have to call medical control. Okay. Um, if you don't have epinephrine, okay, then it's transport and see if you can get paramedic unit to intercept you. There's two doses of epinephrine, whether you're doing it by auto injector or by um, you drawing it up yourself. And the decision of how to give it is by the weight of the patient. If they weigh over 30 kilograms and 30 kilograms translates into 66 pounds, you give the adult dose, which is 0.3 milligrams. And if they're under 66 pounds or 30 kilograms, you give the pediatric dose, which is 0.15 milligrams. Okay, now this is the way we do it um, nowadays, which is that we actually have a vial of epinephrine, just like in a doctor's office. We have a syringe, we have alcohol preps, we have a needle, we have a band aid, all packaged in a little kit, and we do it that way. This whole kit together costs about 50 bucks. 
uh, probably if you bought the individual components on your own, it probably cost you about 20 bucks um, to do it. So it's a lot cheaper than the couple hundred dollars that the, uh, you know, the EpiPen, and you actually have multiple doses in here. On the uh, adult side, you actually have three doses in this vial, three doses of 0.3 milligrams. And on the pediatric, you actually have six doses of the pediatric in here. So you have multiple doses, much cheaper way. What's the side effect that you have to remember how to draw it up and you have to be good at drawing it up and I'll show you some of the issues. Okay, so everything's in there that you need. Now, to be able to get fluid out of a vial and they'll show you this, okay, you have to first inject air. This is right now inside this vial. When you unpackage it, when it's like this, there is no air inside of here, okay? Because when they package it, they don't want it to have any chance of, you know, breaking down or getting contaminated. So when they package it, they package it in a vacuum, which means there's no air, okay? So to be able to draw fluid out of what's called a vacuum, a non-pressurized container, you have to add air up to it. So the first thing you do is you have to draw back on the syringe. Let me see if the next picture shows a little better. You have to draw back the plunger, right? So there's two parts to the syringe. There's the part that moves in and out. That's called the plunger. Okay, and then the barrel is the part that, you know, stays, doesn't move, okay? So you have to pull this plunger back, okay, to the amount that you want to actually give and then inject that amount of air up into the vial so that you could then withdraw the amount of fluid you want. So in other words, you have to break that vacuum, um, that non-pressurized uh, vial by injecting air up into it so you can draw out the fluid. Now, the mistake that people make is that as they're drawing it out, they pull it back very quickly. And what happens is they get a big air bubble up here. So they pull back this to where they think they need to go, but they don't realize that it's not, this entire part is not filled with the actual medication because they have this air bubble up here. Then they pull it out and they inject it into the patient, assuming they're giving the correct dose, but they really gave a lot less because of this air bubble that was over here. So it just takes practice. And they're going to show you how to get the air out and, you know, draw it up the right way. You know, Dovid is a nurse and he's practiced giving injections, I'm sure, a million times. Um, it's just really practiced. Again, the problem is going to be is that you're going to practice it a couple of times in class and then not see it again. And, you know, like any skill, the more you do it, the better you get it, get at it. So this is the problem. And again, the big problem is that when you're going to have to do it, it's in a life threatening situation. That's why using the auto injectors is so much better because it takes out you having to know how to draw up the medication and make sure you draw up the right amount out of the equation. And, you know, it, it's much simpler and safer uh, that way, but it's a cost factor, like everything. Now, this particular syringe that comes with this package only has two lines on it, okay? So line number one is, um, is the uh, pediatric dose and line number two is the adult dose. You see it says 0.15 and 0.3. Um, of course, like everything in America, the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, recalled these syringes and said that nobody actually ever had them tested to make sure they're good. So they were recalled, even though they were great devices. So right now we're using a regular syringe that instead of just having these two markings, has 10 lines, has 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5. So the 0.3 is not a problem because it's on there. But the problem is to give 0.15, you're giving, you're drawing up between the 0.1 and the 0.2 to give it. And, uh, and you'll see that, you know, when you practice um, the other day. So that's the only issue is it's a little harder um, to draw it up with the, you know, the non-safety syringes and stuff like that. Okay. So again, let's just review real quick. An allergen is something that somebody's allergic to. Okay. So it's what causes them to have an allergic reaction. People can have multiple things they're um, allergic to, or they could just have one thing, right? The antigen, okay, is the way in medicine they would actually describe an allergen. So it's pretty much the same term. Don't worry about it on the test. They're not going to ask allergen or antigen probably, but they may say, you know, what do antibodies do? Antibodies are the part of the immune system, okay, that fights the thing that's causing the problem in your body, right? Fights the thing that you're allergic to. And in people who have anaphylaxis is what triggers the anaphylactic reaction. It's not supposed to do that. Like in other words, I get stung by a bee and I say, ow, and it gets a little itchy and that's it. Okay, somebody else gets stung by a bee and their throat closes and they die. So the normal response would be that, you know, it's a little painful, it hurts. 
and that the antibodies go and attack the venom and get rid of it for me, but I don't die from it. And some people, for some reason, they don't understand why, their immune system is very sensitive, it overreacts, and they have this severe anaphylactic reaction to it, okay? So what's the difference between an allergic reaction and anaphylaxis? An allergic reaction basically stops with just the skin symptoms. It doesn't progress on to the life-threatening breathing problems and the, um, the vasodilation, the blood pressure dropping. Histamine, we said, is the substance that's released, okay, that starts this whole anaphylactic reaction, okay, and it's what causes the vasodilation, it's what causes the swelling of the airway and so on, okay? Allergic reactions happen, okay? We've all experienced allergic reactions in our lives. Anaphylaxis is not a common thing, okay? But once somebody has anaphylaxis, they're obviously are prone to getting it again. Now, it is possible to get desensitized. What does that mean? It is possible to go to an allergist, a doctor that specializes in this type of stuff. It's very expensive. But what they would do is that over a period of months to a year, they would give you tiny little doses of what you're allergic to, okay, and try to get your body used to that substance and convince your body that it's not anything bad. And they have to do it in a very controlled environment of doctor's office with epinephrine available if it triggers an anaphylactic reaction and so on. Um, but it is possible, okay. The other thing you'll see now from a, a, a childbirth or an infant standpoint is that what they're really saying now is to introduce all types of foods to kids when they're very young, when they're infants, not to withhold, um, you know, uh, peanuts and this and that and all different things from a child, because when they're tiny little babies, their immune system is developing. And if those things are introduced to them, they will not be, uh, the, the immune system will not be afraid of it in the future. But it's something, you know, if you have a new baby or something you have to speak to the pediatrician about, but there's, you know, there's lots of articles out there about, you know, what not to give a, a baby and what to give a baby, but there's no reason in the world why babies can't have a little bit of peanuts, can't have a little bit of milk, can't, you know, um, again, if they do have an allergic reaction to it, then you know that um, they are going to be allergic to it, but most babies don't have allergic reactions because their immune system is not developed enough yet to trigger the allergic reaction. So and that's only something that's really kind of changed in the last five years or so. Um, and a lot of it actually was from Israel. Uh, Israel very early recognized that, you know, withholding all this stuff from kids until they were older and their immune system was much stronger, was just causing them to have these allergic reactions. So they, they do not withhold a lot of foods from kids. And they found that it was very um, beneficial in preventing kids from having allergies. The other thing that's beneficial from preventing kids from having allergies is to make sure that they're breastfed. Um, that definitely helps because they're getting antibodies from the mother uh, via the breast milk and stuff like that. So again, it kind of trains their immune system not to be afraid of things. Um, and then the last thing is to make sure that you do not raise your kids in a sterile environment. What that means is that it's okay for kids to get dirty. Okay, it's okay for them to be outside. It's okay for them, their hands to be dirty. It's okay for them to stick their fingers in their mouth, you know, and stuff like that. And none of that is bad because what it's doing basically is getting the immune system ready for life. Um, there was a large study looking at kids that were raised on farms versus kids that were raised uh, in, in the city. And kids that were raised on farms had much less um, of any kind of allergy problems, really in general health problems, than kids were to raised in the city. And it was basically because the farm lifestyle of being outdoors and around animals and around all this different stuff basically trained your immune system to realize that, you know, it's okay to be around this stuff and you don't need to have an allergic reaction to it. So, you know, just again, it's stuff that you have to have, you know, discussions with your pediatrician. The problem nowadays is that, you know, with doctors trying, you know, every doctor trying to make money to stay in business, they don't have a lot of time to talk to patients because especially pediatricians, they really get paid by volume, right? To see as many patients as possible. So it's kind of hard to have a, a real and detailed, you know, conversation with people and stuff like that uh, because they're rushed to see the next patient. Okay. So again, the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, okay, vasodilation, bronchoconstriction, the leaky capillaries, right? The increased capillary permeability that causes the hives and the swelling and the stuff like that. Okay. Um, the, the, the thicker mucus that's developing, that's closing up the airways and stuff like that. Again, the, the quicker you recognize or, uh, or the quicker you give the epinephrine, the better likelihood for them to be able to, um, you know, to make it through it. Again, differentiating between localized means they're just having skin symptoms, 
versus systemic multiple body systems involved. Again, the two we're most worried about are the respiratory system and the vasodilation of the blood vessels. Epinephrine is the best drug in the world to use because it reverses the, the life-threatening problems that occur. So it constricts the blood vessels, okay, and dilates the bronchioles so that they can breathe again. Okay, again, the bad part of epinephrine is the strain it puts on the heart, okay, which can be somewhat alleviated if, the, if you can raise the patient's oxygen level, right, if, they can, if they'll um, allow you to administer oxygen, okay. So what are the indications to administer epinephrine? A patient who truly has anaphylaxis, right? So a patient who's having any complaint of any problem with breathing, okay, or a patient who, um, you know, got bad before you got there and is already having trouble breathing or already dropped their blood pressure, okay? Common causes of allergic reactions, we say could be anything, but the most common things would be uh, venoms of insects, okay? Certain medications, specifically antibiotics and aspirin, and then foods, right? Uh, whether it be milk or, or peanuts or, you know, I mean, fish, there's a million different things that be, can be, uh, you know, but those are the more common things and stuff like that. On the skin, we said we see red flush skin, we see hives, which is called urticaria, and we see itchiness, respiratory system, upper airway, the larynx, we have uh, laryngeal swelling. So we have strider on, on when the patient's breathing in, right? So uh, strider is a prolonged inspiratory sound where they're going, ee in and then lower airway, the bronchioles, we have wheezing, which is a expiratory sound uh, to start with trying, it's harder for them to get the air out. Doesn't matter really in the big uh, scheme of things because you're basically closing off the entire airway uh, with both problems and they're not getting any air in. Cardiovascular system, we said the vasodilation, okay, and the increased capillary permeability are the two biggest problems there. Okay, so now we got a 24 year old kid um, I, again, I'm, I'm getting a little old, so I think 24 as a kid. Um, I, I, I realized that I got old when I look at the about, I don't know, seven years ago, I started looking at the, the rosters and looking at the students' ages. And when I stopped seeing anybody the same age as me or older, I realized I got old. Um, there was a, we did a refresher class uh, two summers ago. There were two gentlemen from KJ that were actually uh, 20 years older than me. So I felt great. I felt like I was the kid in the class. Um, there's a, so we got a 24 year old kid here who um, ate a meal that thinks contains shellfish. He's allergic to shrimp. He's sweating and nervous. He appears to be breathing adequately. You do not know, notice any wheezing or strider. So what do you think? Do you think he needs epinephrine? So we don't really have enough information, right? Because we need to know what happens when he has his allergic reaction. So if he says to you, oh, I really haven't had one in years, you know, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's too bad. Maybe you'll start transporting and see how he goes. If he says to you, every time this happens, I almost die, you're going to get and give him the epinephrine. If he says to you, now I feel like my throat's closing and I can't breathe, you're going to get and give him the epinephrine. So this guy's kind of sitting on the, the fence, right? Because we don't really have a lot of information. We're not looking at him. Is but, it going to be a test question? No, they usually will present it very clear, like in other words, and you know, maybe that's what we'll do on Saturday night. Now that we've gone further into the, uh, the classes, we can go back and look at some questions that we skipped over because we didn't cover it. But no, they usually give you very clear uh, questions that, you know, the patient's definitely treatable and stuff like that. So I, I they don't usually give very, uh, you know, vague questions. They're usually pretty clear questions. Okay, so his face is slightly red. His pulse is 88 and strong and regular. Respirations at 24. He's got a pressure of 108 on 74. Skin warm and moist. Did you administer epinephrine? I would say right now, even with this set of vital signs, no. I mean, some of you might say 108 over 74 is low. But again, he's 24 years old. We don't know if he's, you know, in decent shape and stuff like that. So to be honest with you, we all wish we had a pressure of 108 over 74. So I, I would not say that's very low. Uh, you know, a new... Uh, good blood pressure is 110 over 70. Used to be 120 over 80. Now they like 110 over 70. So 108 over 74 is definitely not a low blood pressure in a patient unless you know, or he knows what his blood pressure is normally and it, that it's normally much higher than that. Okay, so let me see if I can find um, some better pictures of the things we were just talking about. In the meantime, if anybody has any questions, um, must have been still young because you went two hours without a break. <laughs> oh, once I start talking, I can go forever. That's my biggest, uh, my biggest fault. I, uh, 
Frank, is a, a, a snake venom considered allergic reaction? Or so that's a interesting. Category? Interesting. So with a snake, you could have one or two things. You could just have the venom doing what the venom is supposed to do, and that could kill the person. Or you could have somebody having an allergic reaction to the snake bite. So it, it really depends on the situation. But since most people have never been bitten by a snake before, and nobody's really been exposed to venom of a snake before, most of the times people do not have allergic reactions uh, from snake bites. But it is possible. Very rare, but it's possible. No, I'm saying uh, it doesn't do the same thing as an allergic reaction, like a bee bite. Right. The, no, what the, I'm saying epinephrine is epinephrine is not going to help for us. For it's not it's not going to do anything for us. Uh, snake bite. If if the patient was having anaphylaxis, yes. But if they're just having the signs of the venom, let me show you in a second here. But um, I don't see any good pictures yet. No. Um, now, when there's a bee bite, is it important to take out the sting also? So that's a good question. So the problem with taking out the stinger is that at the at on the stinger there's a venom sac. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, well, here let's look at this one for a second. Uh, how do we do this? So here, boy, if this kid had payas, I would actually think he's Jewish. Um, but here, in other words, what happened with his anaphylaxis? So you see how his eyes kind of swelled shut. Now we don't know he's having anaphylaxis. He may just be having a, a mild allergic reaction. Okay, you can see this, right? You can see the picture? Can you yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. So he has what's called angioedema, which is his eyes are swelling. You would expect his lips also to be swelling. Okay, you know, here, again, people start scratching their throat, right? So that would be a sign that they're feeling something in their throat. So that would be something else you'd say, okay. I need to, you know, I need to start thinking about getting that epinephrine ready. Okay. Again, here's um here's a picture of somebody. Hold on one second, let me see if I can. Okay, so this is his throat. So a lot of times, right, you're gonna see it doing exactly like this. And that's telling you that there's probably something going on inside his body, okay? Oh, you see, actually, they put one of the signs, feeling of doom, right? They feel like something bad is happening to them. Uh, I don't see any more pictures here. It's a gallery. Go back to the first picture. Oh, you saw it? Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, same kid. Oh, so this is a tongue swelling. I had this one time, a guy was fishing and he had a can of soda and he reached to grab his can of soda and took a drink. And as he was taking a drink, he felt a terrible pain in his tongue. And it must have been that the bee flew into the soda. And as he um, took the drink, it must have stung his tongue. And his tongue swelled up to the point where you could barely hear him talking. So we, we treated him. And when the swelling went down, his main complaint was that he felt the bee in his stomach. The bee was stinging him in his stomach. And I, as much as I could explain to him that the bee is dead, that the minute it entered your stomach, the acid in your stomach dissolved it and it's gone. And there's no way it could be stinging you. That's all he kept on saying to me was he felt the bee stinging himself, this bee, bee stinging him in his stomach. And I said, okay. I said, but, uh, you know, and he was worried about that as it traveled through his, you know, his intestinal tract, it was going to keep on stinging him. So there was nothing I could do to convince him otherwise. Uh, but that was what his, uh, his main complaint was. So it says there's 11, oh, 11 pictures, but I don't see 11 pictures. So uh, let's see if there's anything else. So there's all different ways. So the interesting thing about hives is that they could appear in many different ways. Um, you know, so some of them even appear like they look like there's like worms crawling under the skin. I'm just trying to see if I could see one of those. But these are all different pictures of, you know, hives. 
how they appear on the body. Um, so interestingly, there are um, there is the ability. I don't know exactly how they do it, but there's the ability actually to you know draw on them, and it actually comes out that way. I forgot exactly how it happens, but um, I'll look, try to look that up. Um, then the other thing I wanted to show you was this angio. I think it's it's just writing with something that they're allergic to. Oh, maybe it could be. Because usually when when they take the allergy test, you see exactly where they poked to, yeah. to take the test. So this is angioedema where their their lips start to swell up and stuff like that, um, and their eyelids start to swell up. It's just called. It's I mean again they're not going to use the term, but so you see like here it's real severe. So that would be in itself, right? You would have to assume that that's going to progress on to, you know, breathing problems. And you probably would go ahead and treat them unless they just tell you that's all that happens is their lip swells. Sometimes only one side swells and not the other side. Um, I had a case where people were burning uh, leaves and one of the people that the smoke went on, their face all swelled up, but they had zero problems breathing. Um, so it was not anaphylaxis. It was actually what they think happened was that in the stuff they were burning, there must have been some poison ivy, and that when they were burning it, the smoke had the oil of the poison ivy, and that's what was causing the uh, the allergic reaction in that patient. So he had no other thing except that his face was kind of swelling up and stuff like that. So it was um, interesting, uh, interesting case. Let me just see if we... The only other thing I wanted to show you was the the EpiPen. Okay, so let's see if there's any better picture of this. Well, this is actually showing you what the needle looks like. It's actually a pretty big needle. Um, this is making it look like, I don't know, I think it's just the angle of the picture. The thing is like two feet long. It's not. You saw it's only, you know, probably about five, six inches long. But when the patient's injected, right, they're injected on the side of their leg. Um, you know, you want, there's like a big muscle that's kind of running all over here, injected over here. Uh, when we do check and inject, um, where we're drawing it up ourselves, we actually give it in a deltoid muscle. I'll show you that. I had a picture over here with a muscle on this page. Adds oh, did we? Okay, picture. hold on. Let me see. Well, this is showing you go through clothing. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Okay, hold on one second. Oh. Um, I'm just not sure how I would. Let me see if I can. Hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there's a new thing. Okay. You can't hear the audio on that, right? We can. We heard it. We heard it. I'm not really. Heard? 
not really. Hold on one second. There's a way of doing it. Let me just see. Send the system audio settings. Uh, let's see video. Where are my video? There's something about share audio somewhere. Now here it is. Oops. Okay, share computer sound. FDA regulation you can that, hear that? Uh, requires yeah, changes with this kit. So we're just going to go through some of the updated changes, and I think you'll like some of them. All right, so this is what the kit looks like now. Um, it's made by Curaplex. Um, once you open it up, um, there's going to be a new updated syringe, and we'll talk about that in a second, and then the epinephrine, and then alcohol and Band-Aid as before. Um, and as far as just making sure you check the, um, the expiration date. The syringe is the biggest change that I want to review with you today, and it's a generic one mil syringe, but it has some cool safety features. And the FDA has regulated that we can no longer have the letters A for adult and P for pediatric on here. It's now a generic one mil syringe with, um, it's um, measured in tenths now. So as far as your policy, Pediatrics or children require 0.15 mLs, and adults require 0.3. And so once you draw up your medication, you're gonna notice that the needle is already attached. You're going to draw up your medi desired medication to the desired dose. And once you administer the medication, there's a new safety device on here. So once you push the plunger to give the medication, when you're done giving the medication, you're gonna put a little more pressure at the end and the needle retracts back up into the syringe. Wow. Um, so we don't wanna have any needle sticks out in the field when we're caring for our patients. So that's a, cr a really cool new change. Um, I wanna make sure all of you get your hands on this in your classes uh, so you understand how that new syringe works and how the new numbering is. Um, so good luck out there. That's actually a pretty, uh, pretty awesome uh... Yeah, but then if you need a second dose, you don't have the needle. Yeah, but you, have a, you could always, they probably carry more than one two kit, or you could just actually get another needle. Let me see if I could find the actual one that's No, I'm just, uh, just curious. Why, why would the FDA take off the... the, the because uh, what, hap what happened was that there was a rush to do this very cheap. That was the big rush to do everything very cheap. So Hello, and welcome to Check and Inject. Once you, um, you, know, once you involve the FDA, it's going to be a year. And it's going to be a lot of money to get it approved. So basically, somebody went to a uh, probably a syringe manufacturer in China, and said, "I want a syringe with no lines, no numbers, just two, you know, two things." And you know, it was a good idea. And they had a you know a, a, a A for an adult, and a C for child, you know, and and that was it. It was very simple, and you know, couldn't really make a mistake. And um, I thought it's it's because they don't want anybody to identify if someone. Someone identifies themselves as an other. No, no. It was it was really probably that the companies in America that make syringes were realizing they weren't making any money, and they, they probably called up the FDA and complained because that company that now is making that other one is probably making a fortune on it. But here, let me show you this one. Update. This is Sean Halsman, paramedic and education. Oh, it may not run. Oh, the other one ran nicely guy at Twin City Ambulance and this module is going to deal with some upcoming changes in the New York State check and inject kits. Uh, the training is put together so that you have an idea of what's coming and so that you can navigate that skillfully when it does happen which should be January 1st at the latest but you may see changes even sooner. Real quickly, we'll go over what's involved in the kit again. There's some alcohol preps. You have your instructions here, which will likely be changing. Uh, you've got your needle. You will have a, a vial of adrenaline or epinephrine, and then you'll have your Band-Aid. Uh, and the big thing that will be changing in these kits will be the EpiSafe syringe, and we'll uh, discuss that uh, very shortly. 
Here is the collaborative protocol for adult anaphylaxis, and you'll see that uh, if a patient has exposure to a known allergen and is developing respiratory distress and or hypotension, we're going to administer uh, the 0.3 of epi as an adult. However, uh, there is also this second part of it, which says if they have a rash and a history of true anaphylaxis, meaning they've had shock before, then we're going to be administering uh, a dose as well. For the pediatric, it's a little different. We're not going to be taking the rash into consideration. However, uh, this is where the dosing comes in. And you'll notice that for uh, a child who is greater than or equal to 30 kilograms, which is 66 pounds, we're going to be giving 0.3. And for a child who is less than 30 kilograms, we'll be giving 0.15 mLs. Now this is the same dose that is listed in the check and inject instructions right now, adult and child dosing, 0.3 and 0.15 uh, respectively. You will note the fill to A and fill to P. That portion of the instructions will be disappearing very soon. The reason for this change is the EpiSafe syringe itself. Now, the EpiSafe syringe was initially designed to help providers who are not paramedics draw up the appropriate amount of medication. They are marked with a 0.15 and a 0.3 line only so that there was no in between. There's been some concern about the syringes and whether uh, appropriate dosages are being brought up, so we are now going to be using a graduated syringe. Not a big deal. Don't get too freaked about this. 0.15 and 0.3 still exist on this syringe. There's 0.15 and there is 0.3. And the only difference is there's a bunch of other numbers on there. But quite honestly, we're not worried about those. We're still going to be doing the exact same procedure. So for the purpose of comparison here, we'll just show you how it looked drawing up epi with the epi safe syringe and notice that you check the date you check that it's the correct medication adrenaline or epi you injected your 0.3 of air into the vial to break the seal and then you pulled out your 0.3 of epi for an adult and you you see here they were tapping the air bubbles to get to the top and now all up here is air so even though he said he wanted to give 0.3 so he actually drew up more than he needed because what's going to happen now to get this air out, he's going to push the plunger up to the 0.3, which is going to expel the air out. But sometimes you actually have to do it more than once to get the right amount up. Pop the bubbles out. So we did that. We dispelled the extra epinephrine and got rid of it. For a pediatric dose for a patient who is less than 66 pounds or 30 kilograms, we draw up the 0.15. This is exactly the same process with the graduated syringe. It's not that difficult. So we're going to draw up the same air, 0.3 of air. We're going to inject that air into the vial. And here we are drawing that up. So we have our bubbles in there we'll get rid of. And then we're going to get the extra out. And we have 0.3 now of epinephrine. So, the But if you look, you see he still has air up here. So if he were to, he, he's not actually having the right amount of the drug, and that's the common mistake. The other thing I wanted to point out is he was saying there is still a, a 0.15, but there's not. You see there's a 0.1 and a 0.2, but there is a line halfway between 0.1 and 0.2, which is 0.15, right? So that's what he's kind of trying to say. But this is the problem is that if you don't actually look at it, so really what's happening now is that he's probably giving the patient, instead of 0.3 milligrams, probably giving him like 0.28 milligrams because he's got air up in here. So really what would happen happen is he'd have to draw up more epinephrine, maybe come down when he was doing it the first time, come to 0.5, and then push it up to 0.3, which will get the air out, and then you should have the right amount of drug, okay? So that's, that's the problem. But you'll, it'll make much more sense when you're actually trying to practice with the uh, syringes. On that's side. good to go, and we can do our injection from here. Had the patient been a smaller patient, a child, or someone less than 30 kilograms, uh, we just have to figure out where the spot is. And it's right there between one and two. So here is a 0.1 ml mark. Here's a 0.2 ml mark. And then right in between is your 0 0.15 mls. It's, it's pretty easy to find that. There shouldn't be any difficulty there. It's the exact same procedure that we use with the EpiSafe syringe. So the upshot of all this is that the EpiSafe syringe is being discontinued. Uh, some of the kits already have a 1 ml syringe in them, and the kits that come out after January 1st. Let me just see. I still haven't found one where we're actually doing the injection, but I'll give one more try, and then we'll see. 
This video demonstrates how to set up and perform an intramuscular injection. Equipment required includes the following. A physician's medication chart with written orders, an ampule or vial containing the correct medication, a vial of diluent as needed, a range of sterile disposable needles, Don't worry about all a selection this. of syringes, alcohol swabs, sterile gauze swabs, hypoallergenic dressing, the patient's medical record, non-sterile examination gloves or latex-free gloves if indicated, a biohazard sharps container, biohazard bags. While these come in various colors, they can be identified by the universal biohazard symbol. Please check your institution and state regulations to confirm which bag is used. Cleaning agents, a patient education sheet, and a pen. Wash your hands I'm gonna skip and set a up bit. a tray with the required equipment. Necessary. ...date on the vial. Inspection is clear. Syringe and needle for drawing up the medication. Attach a 20 to 22 gauge needle to a 2 milliliter syringe ready to draw up the medication. Use a filter needle if drawing up from a glass ampule. Okay, we're not going to draw from the ampules. So. Conduct the second ampule. Whirl the ampule to encourage the medication to settle. In Cover the top of the ampule with a sterile gauze biohazard sharp ampule and extract the correct dose. Rises to the top of the syringe. Oh. Recap the needle using the container. Carefully insert the needle into the ampule and extract the correct dose. Remove any air bubbles from the syringe by lightly tapping the syringe and then expelling the air that rises to the top of the syringe. Ensure that the correct dose has been drawn up. Recap the needle using the one hand technique or remove the filter needle without recapping and discard it. Oh, that's not good either. Okay, I'll try to find one for uh, Saturday night, but um, I wanted to find one where they actually give an injection and stuff. This video demonstrates how to set up and perform an intro. Okay, so everyone have a uh, have a good night, have a good rest of the week, and I'll um, try to send out the invitation tomorrow or the day after for Saturday night, and we'll see if we can do a little more review before you do skills on Sunday, okay? Thank you very much. Have a good night. Okay, have a great night. Take care, everyone. We have class tomorrow, correct? Uh, oh, yeah, we do, actually. I forgot oh, we're doing toxicology. Good. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It all blends together. Okay. No problem. Take Make care. sure to give a break for five minutes. Okay. Yeah, just remind me. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank good night. you.